This hearing will come to order. Good morning and welcome to the Budget Committee's hearing on <clears throat> why Congress needs to abolish the debt limit. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recesses of the committee at any time. Uh, before I begin, I wanna welcome the newest member of the Budget Committee representing Ohio's 15th district, Mike Carey. Mike served in the Army National Guard in the energy industry before coming to Congress. Uh, welcome Mike Carey to the committee. Uh, we're happy to have you here. In addition, we are honored to have Majority Leader Steny Hoyer here with us this morning. Without objection, the gentleman from Maryland, the Distinguished Majority Leader, is permitted to join the committee for the purposes of participating in this hearing. Without objection, so ordered. Now, before I welcome our witnesses, I'll go over a few housekeeping matters. Today, the committee is meeting virtually. Before we begin, I would like to remind members participating in this proceeding to keep your camera on at all times even if you are not under recognition by the chair. Members may not participate in more than one committee proceeding simultaneously. If you choose to participate in a different proceeding, please turn your camera off. Members are responsible for their own microphones. Please mute your microphones when you are not speaking. This will help prevent feedback and other technical issues. Please remember to unmute yourself when you seek recognition. Note that the chair or staff designated by the chair may mute participants' microphones when they are not under recognition for the purposes of eliminating inadvertent background noise. We are not permitted to unmute members unless they explicitly request assistance. If I notice that you have not unmuted yourself, I will ask if you would like staff to unmute you. If you indicate approval by nodding, staff will unmute your microphone. <clears throat> they will not unmute your microphone under any other conditions. I'd like to remind members that we have established an email inbox for submitting documents before and during committee proceedings. And we have distributed that email address to your staff. Now I will introduce our witnesses. This morning, we will be hearing from Dr. Laura Blessing, Senior Fellow at the Government Affairs Institute at Georgetown University. Dr. Louise Shaner, the Robert S. Kerr Senior Fellow in Economic Studies and Policy Director for the Hutchins Center on Fiscal and monetary policy at the Brookings Institution. Ms. Luana Russell, founder and president of Business Management Associates Incorporated and chair of the Small Business Majority. And uh, one of our former colleagues and a friend, the Honorable Mick Mulvaney, former director of the Office of Management and Budget, uh, chief of staff to the president of the United States and also former representative from the state of South Carolina. We welcome all of our witnesses. I will now yield myself five minutes for an opening statement. <clears throat> We've made remarkable strides to heal our economy in 2021 with the fastest GDP growth in nearly four decades, the most jobs created in a single year ever, and unemployment down to 4%, more than three years ahead of projections. And we recently received a CBO report that showed record wage growth and increased consumer purchasing power. I'd like to thank Ranking Member Smith for requesting this enlightening report which also found that wage growth is in fact outpacing inflation. And I'd like to submit that into the record at this point without objection, so ordered. Make no mistake, these gains were not inevitable. Thanks to the American Rescue Plan and President Biden's and Congressional Democrats' economic, excuse me. Sorry. President Biden's and Congressional Democrats' economic agenda, our recovery is, is, recovery is beating projections and setting records. We've made tremendous progress in a short period of time, but there's still more work to be done. Elevated prices, which we believe are mostly temporary, are a serious issue. That's why we have passed legislation to fix supply chain bottlenecks, lower costs for families, revitalize American innovation and manufacturing, and create good paying jobs here in America. The investments in the bipartisan infrastructure bill are quickly being rolled out to every state across the country. And soon we will enact the America Competes Act to get our economy fully firing on all cylinders. However, there is a problem. The debt ceiling now plays an outsized role in our politics and congressional deliberations, something that was never intended. This century, century old law was created to make borrowing easier, not harder. Its misuse has already jeopardized our ongoing recovery once, and now threatens the future of our economy and the American people. We'll get into the details of why it we think it needs to be abolished during this hearing, 
but because I cannot think of another provision of budget law that has been as misused, misunderstood, and misrepresented about as much as the debt limit, I want to lay down the facts right away. The debt ceiling is not the amount we can spend. It is not like the limit on a credit card, an analogy we hear a lot. The debt limit is the amount we already owe. It is the bill for previous spending and tax decisions made by Congress. You cannot reduce the national debt by failing to raise the debt ceiling, and we have 100 years of evidence of that. Uh, you will default on the full faith and credit of the United States by failing to raise the debt ceiling, and that would be cataclysmic for our economy and American households. The debt ceiling has been raised to pay for the actions of both Democratic and Republican Congresses. Here's an example. Republicans enacted massive tax cuts for big corporations and the rich in 2017. Congress has needed to raise the debt limit every year since and will need to for several more years just to cover the growing debt from this tax giveaway. So even if Congress did not spend a single additional dime after President Biden was elected, no COVID aid, no infrastructure bill, nothing, we would still need to raise the debt ceiling to cover Republicans deficit ballooning and re regressive tax policy. Clearly, the only real role the debt ceiling now plays is a chip to be exploited for political gain. But there's a real human cost to this political gamesmanship. Every threat of default comes with the risk of actually defaulting. And in a closely divided Congress with members who have openly called for destroying the full faith and credit of the United States, that is a risk we can no longer afford. As I said before, a full breach of the debt limit would be catastrophic. The immediate fallout would have severe widespread and painful consequences for the American people and our economic and national security. Treasury would be unable to fund Social Security, Medicaid, nutrition benefits, military salaries, law enforcement, unemployment insurance, and more. Americans would be forced to go without these vital supports until Congress managed to lift this imaginary ceiling. A breach would also cause immediate financial market chaos, which would likely spread around the world. This would lead to higher interest rates and make consumer products like car loans and mortgages more expensive, hurting American families. It would also likely threaten our status as the global reserve currency and create an opening for a global competitor like China to step in and take our place at the top of the global economy. Again, Americans would be forced to pay the price in Congress's failure with a weakened US dollar and higher costs. In Congress in this environment, and as long as the debt limit remains in place, there's a direct threat to our entire economy and Congress is becoming less and less capable of diffusing it. It's time to abolish the debt ceiling. I look forward to hearing from our panel of witnesses who will share their expert analysis and firsthand experience with the costs and risks of this outdated law. Uh, with that, I'd like to yield to the ranking member, Mr. Smith. Unmute your microphone, please. And uh, you have five minutes for your opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to welcome our newest member of the committee as well, Mr. Carey from Ohio. It's great that our committee is at full representation, hopefully, the, the Democrat party will not remove any more from our committee and we get to keep this same, um, same membership moving forward. But I'd also like to welcome our witnesses today, which includes one of the former colleagues, uh, one of our former colleagues and a former member of this committee, Director Mulvaney, who coincidentally was sworn in as head of the White House Office of Management and Budget almost exactly five years ago today. At, at the time, that was the latest ever that an OMB director assumed the job in a new administration, a little less than one month after a new president was sworn in. But under the Biden administration, we are now a year longer than that without an OMB director. There's a lot to unpack today, but before I start, I have to address um, the CBO score, the CBO um, uh, letter that you submitted into the record. I'm glad that you did, because in fact, that record shows and proves, according to the Congressional Budget Office, that inflation is outpacing wage growth. And when you talk to any American, any American, they won't buy what you're selling. They know that they can't purchase as many as goods today as what they could a year ago. And it's because of inflation. And whenever you try to say that increases in prices are only temporary, they're not buying it either. And you know what? The economists aren't either. 
seven and a half percent year to year, the highest inflation in 40 years. Give me a break. But I'm glad you put that in the record, because in fact, that CBO score showed that inflation in rural areas is 130 percent more than in urban areas. So thanks for putting that into the record, Mr. Chairman. There's a lot to unpack today, but I will start by saying that it seems budget seems budget Democrats are working at cross purposes. Last year, we had a hearing about Congress's power of the purse and how to reassert our constitutional role in budgeting and spending so that it wasn't being unsurped by executive branch decision making. What we learned was that if Congress did its job, budgeting, appropriating, and authorizing programs on a timely basis, it would go a long way to removing the ability of unelected bureaucrats to, to make decisions about government spending while also restoring some fiscal sanity to Washington. And yet, today we're talking about passing off Congress's responsibility for the debt to unelected career government employees. This would severely undermine, if not destroy, the power of the purse my colleagues claim they believed in less than a year ago. It would allow Congress to take credit for spending without being accountable for the debt it creates. Which brings us back to today's hearing. The real reason we're here is because Democrats want to get rid of any obstacles standing in the way of their radical agenda. An agenda that has unleashed a multitude of crises, the highest spike in prices in 40 years, a national debt above 30 trillion, and that's with the T, businesses facing chronic worker shortages and a supply chain crisis. For the last 12 months, Mr. Chairman, Democrats have been focused on their partisan agenda while the check engine light of the Biden economy has been on and flashing bright. Inflation rose faster in Joe Biden's first year in office than President Trump's entire first term. Democrats first denied inflation existed. You denied today and said that it's only temporary in some cases, and then dismissed it as transitory. Even members of this committee, like you, Mr. Chairman, um, said panicking over inflation was uninformed and misguided. Economists warned for months of the impact that reckless government spending would have on inflation. What did Democrats do? They spent $2 trillion in the president's bailout bill, a bill they claimed was meant for COVID, but less than 9% went to combating the virus. The crisis has been especially painful for Americans living in rural communities. Recently, the CBO found inflation what you just submitted to the record in rural areas was 130% that of urban areas, and they experienced 25% slower real wage growth than urban areas. Now Democrats are claiming a $5 trillion spending bill will fix inflation, even though it was written while Democrats were either denying inflation or calling it transitory. And even though the CBO has confirmed it, uh, it would cost, it would add $3 trillion to the debt, if we combine the $68 trillion in spending Democrats called for in their fiscal year 22 budget with what they have passed since Nancy Pelosi became speaker in 2019, it'd be more than all taxes paid by every American in U.S. history. For the last 40 years, the debt limit has typically been one of the only times that Congress has had a serious conversation about the national debt. Debt limit negotiations has given us real checks on government spending, including statutory limits on discretionary spending like those in the Budget Control Act of 2011. If the debt limit didn't exist or was raised to a gazillion dollars, as the chairman has suggested in the past, Washington Democrats would spend without end. Democrats claim the government can print as much gentleman, money as it wants could, to spend. You and could budget, please. Your time's expired. I'm giving you much more time, but you can wrap up, please. All right. Well, well, Mr. Chairman, we've seen what happens when Congress tries to exempt itself and the basic laws of economics. Um, we should not allow Congress to exempt itself from our budget laws and hand over more responsibility to elected bureaucrats. I yield back. Uh, thank the ranking member for his, for his opening remarks. I now like to welcome the majority leader of the House of Representatives, Steny Hoyer to our hearing today, uh, and he is recognized for his opening remarks. Um, Majority Leader Hoyer, welcome to the committee. Uh, Mr. Chairman uh, and Mr. Smith, thank you very much for this opportunity to testify on this. 
a very important issue. Frankly, I won't take the time to uh, rebut Mr. Smith's remarks, but I will do so in the future. Uh, but they're not relevant. Either I, when Republicans were in charge and had the, the presidency, the Senate, and the House, uh, nor are they relevant today. As a matter of fact, America is one of the few countries in the world that has a debt limit, and, and none of them go through the crisis that we do. There are three others, at least in the industrialized world, go through the uh, uh, gyrations that we go through when we meet the, the debt limit uh, imposition, which would shut down the government and destroy the economic system uh, in the world if, if we breached uh, that debt. I appreciate the opportunity to speak today to the need to abolish the debt limit as it exists today. The United States is one of only two major industrialized nations to have an arbitrary limit on the amount of debt its government can issue, but we're the only one for which the limit is even more, even remotely uh, within reach. Denmark had the good sense to set theirs so high as to be effectively repealed. I expect we'll hear from our panelists today about the many ways that hitting the debt limit and allowing for default on our nation's obligations would cripple our economy and likely the global financial system, which is why every major Republican leader and president and every Democratic leader has said the debt limit has to be raised anytime we need to raise it. Those consequences are what make the debt limit so dangerous and such a tempting hostage such a tempting hostage. The weaponization of the debt limit puts our country at risk. The serious threat of potential default in 2011 caused Standard & Poor's to downgrade America's credit rating for the first time based on its assessment that our political dysfunction could inadvertently trigger a financial catastrophe rather than our economic or fiscal health. Sadly, Mr. Chairman, I share that assessment. I take some comfort though, in knowing that I'm not alone in believing that we must act aggressively to protect the full faith and credit of the United States. Last September, Doug McMillan, Walmart CEO and chair of the Business Roundtable, wrote a letter with, a, with then BRT President Josh Bolton to Congress. It said, and I quote, Congress has the authority to lift the debt ceiling to safeguard the full faith and credit of the United States and the responsibility to do so. They were right, of course. Safeguarding the full faith and credit of the United States is our responsibility. And to the extent that we are not meeting our responsibility, fie on us, whether we're Republicans or Democrats. We now are operating on a CR. That is a failure for, of us doing our job on time. Very frankly, in this instance, it's because uh, the Senate has not passed a single appropriation bill why? Because the Senate Republicans would not cooperate. Given recent history, it is clear to me that the best way to do so is to eliminate the debt limit entirely, not eliminate the concern about the debt, not eliminate fiscal responsibility, but eliminate the arbitrary and capricious debt limit, which is demagogued repeatedly every time we address it. Short of that, significantly de-weaponize the near constant threat of default posed by the debt limit in its current form, which is what Senator McConnell has proposed. Chairman Yarmouth and Representative Brendan Boyle just yesterday introduced a proposal to that end, building off a process, as I said, first proposed by Senate Minority Leader McConnell back in 2011. They're not the only ones with a proposal. Representative Bill Foster has a a bill of his own to repeal the debt limit. The Bipartisan Policy Center has worked with members like Representative Scott Peters and Jody Arrington on a more complex option to replace it. Over the years, Democrats, Republicans, labor unions, business leaders, and economists have endorsed the notion that at the end of the day, default should not be an option. That is why this hearing is so important and why I'm joining you today to make clear that eliminating the threat of default would be an act of fiscal responsibility. It would not eliminate our responsibility uh, and nor would it eliminate our concern about a debt that is large and growing larger. I thank the committee for holding a hearing on this issue. And I look forward, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Smith to continue to work with all of you, with all of you to ensure the United States always pays its bills on time. The option is not available to us nor should it be. 
Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Majority Leader Hoyer, for your remarks. Uh, in the interest of time, I ask that any other members who wish to make a statement submit their written statements for the record to the email box, in email inbox we established for receiving documents before and during committee proceedings. We've distributed that email address to your staffs and uh, you have that um, available to you. Um, once again, I want to thank um, our witnesses for being here this morning. The committee has received your written statements and they will be made part of the formal hearing record. You each will have five minutes to give your oral remarks. Uh, Dr. Blessing, you're up first. You may unmute your microphone and begin when you are ready. Chair Yarmuth, Ranking Member Smith, members of the committee. My name is Laura Blessing and I'm a senior fellow at the Government Affairs Institute at Georgetown University. Thank you for inviting me to testify on the topic of why Congress needs to abolish the debt ceiling. My goal is to provide additional context for how the debt ceiling has functioned over time in congressional negotiations and its consequences. I'd like to make three main points today. One, Congress has evolved regarding the debt ceiling with a grand trend towards greater brinksmanship. Two, the current situation is particularly worrisome, prompting legislative brinksmanship and risking the catastrophe of default. One, the evolution of the debt ceiling. The debt ceiling was created in 1917 and further modified in 1939. Notably, raising the debt limit does not incur additional spending. Rather, it allows the Treasury to borrow money to cover spending Congress has already voted for. Congress has lifted the debt ceiling over 100 times under administrations and Congresses of both parties. Both parties have politicized it in rhetoric by having the majority of their caucus or conference vote in opposition, by the refusal to bring up a vote, and more since 1953. From these early years, substantial, though not symmetrical, partisan voting patterns are present that worsen over time. There have also been different reforms with lessons for today. The 1970s brought two relevant major reforms. The first is the 1974 Budget Act, which reformed a more ad hoc appropriations process providing regular oversight and a comprehensive consideration of total spending and created a new expert body, the CBO. Previously, the debt ceiling, while still problematic, had functioned as a regular vehicle for such consideration in a process that otherwise largely lacked this. Fiscal stewardship is an important rep congressional responsibility. The debt ceiling is ill-suited for this function, but the larger goal is important. The second major reform was the creation of the Grant Park Rule in 1979 this procedural reform reduced but did not eliminate the number of House votes on the debt ceiling and was helpful but vulnerable to reversal. Speaker Gingrich suspended it in 1995. And it was more definitively repealed in 2011, only to be brought back and modified in less effective form in 2019. These reforms show us that fiscal oversight can happen without the debt ceiling, as well as the benefits and limitations of procedural reform. The 1980s through 2010 brought greater deficits, greater partisanship, and more contentious episodes of debt ceiling showdowns. In this increasingly partisan but not perilous years, a pattern became clear. Those in power tended to vote to raise the limit. Point two, the current era. We're now in an era where Congress has risked default. In 2011, the debt ceiling started to have teeth. President Obama and Speaker Boehner seriously attempted a grand bargain only to be stymied by failures of communication and fundamentally a GOP position to not raise taxes in any bargain. Negotiations came down to the wire. Finally, Vice President Biden and Senate Minority Leader McConnell forged a deal at the last minute. Our credit was still downgraded from its perfect AAA rating for the first time in history. The agreement called for a super committee to find 1.2 trillion in cuts over a decade. Its failure led the Budget Control Act of 2011 to create a decade of sequestration, with those caps raised roughly every two years by Congress. Treasury now regularly relies on extraordinary measures to avert default, 2013 featured another high stakes debt ceiling showdown, also affecting markets. Uh, and this past December, a debt ceiling increase barely passed the Senate on a party line vote right before Treasury's X date for default. Point three, the debt ceiling's effects. The debt ceiling causes brinksmanship, but there's little evidence that the debt ceiling provides fiscal restraint. The debt keeps increasing and the debt ceiling has virtually never been lowered. Consider where it is in the process. Voting separately to service debt that has already been incurred by earlier voting decisions is a reactionary exercise. Some claim that the debt ceiling has prompted negotiations that have resulted in fiscal restraint. 
the counterfactual that even though the ceiling keeps rising, that it could have risen faster. A fuller reading of congressional history would note that amending debt ceiling votes or otherwise using the debt ceiling to negotiate reforms have had truly minor effects, but also that such policies have both saved and cost money. In the early 1970s, debt ceiling votes attracted additional social security benefits. In the 1980s, non-germane amendments included both raising and cutting taxes, increasing the federal gas tax, repealing the windfall profits tax, increasing the tariff on imported oil, and more. Current discourse centers around the 2011 Budget Control Act sequestration regime put into place after the 2011 scare, but that has provided little in fiscal restraint as top line spending caps were regularly raised. Of course, there have been other costs to the Treasury connected to the lack of timeliness of debt ceiling increases. The debt ceiling invites catastrophic risk, aggravates legislating, and does not deliver on fiscal restraint. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to your questions. Sorry, I wasn't unmuted. Uh, now recognize Dr. Shainer for five minutes. Uh, please unmute your microphone and begin when you're ready. Sorry, I had a little technical problems. Um, Chairman Yarmouth, Ranking Member Smith, and committee members, thank you so much for inviting me to talk about the need to abolish the US debt ceiling. I just want to make three points today. First, the debt ceiling does not serve any useful purpose. It has not imposed any significant fiscal discipline on Congress. Second, we don't know exactly what would happen to interest rates and the standing of the United States if Congress someday failed to raise the debt ceiling, but we do know the effects would be negative and possibly calamitous. This is not a risk we should take. Third, our country really does face a lot of long-term economic challenges. We have high levels of inequality and limited economic mobility. We have slow productivity growth. We face the perils of climate change, high healthcare costs, and an unsustainable trajectory for the federal debt. We should address these, but we should address these directly. Bickering over the debt ceiling is a waste of time and energy. It creates unnecessary uncertainty it threatens the benefits that we enjoy of issuing the world's safest asset, and it undermines public confidence in our public institutions. It's important to recognize that the debt limit does not govern the revenues and spending obligations of the federal government. Those are governed by legislation enacted by current and previous Congresses. Instead, the debt limit is a political roadblock that when reached prevents the federal government from fulfilling its already incurred obligations. It's like spending money and then refusing to pay the credit card bill. The debt ceiling would only be a nuisance if Congress lifted it as a matter of course whenever the need arose. However, that has not been the history in recent years. Instead, the debt ceiling has become a political weapon used to try to extract concessions or more recently, simply score political points. Using the debt ceiling as a political weapon or as a way to try to impose fiscal discipline is not a wise choice. At a minimum, the mere possibility that the federal government will not honor its debt obligations undermines confidence in the US economy and in our political institution. It also creates completely unnecessary economic stress for people as federal employees, contractors, social security beneficiaries, the military and the like have to worry about whether or not the US federal government will pay them what they are owed in a timely manner. And it also really distracts policymakers from the serious work of addressing our nation's problems. And using the debt ceiling in this way is also a very risky game. Last fall, we were perhaps just weeks away from having the debt ceiling actually bind, meaning that Treasury would soon have to start delaying payments to, to people to whom it owed money. While that situation was resolved in time, we may not be so fortunate the next time. As I describe in my written testimony, the economic costs of a protracted debt ceiling impasse would most likely be substantial. The sharp cut in federal spending that would be required under a binding debt limit would likely lead to a recession. 
while Treasury would likely choose to prioritize making interest and principal payments on its securities, it's unclear how long that policy could last, both legally and politically. So concerns about actual debt default on debt would likely mount over time, leading to higher interest rates and possibly a failed Treasury auction. In a worst case scenario, Treasury would actually miss a payment on one of its securities. Any of those outcomes would undermine the reputation of the Treasury market as the safest and most liquid in the world. This would not only increase interest rates in the short term, but possibly in the long term as well, because confidence once lost may not be quickly regained. Now, some might argue that the debt ceiling is a necessary evil because it provides a measure of fiscal discipline to the budget process. I think that view is misguided. First, there is little evidence that debt ceiling impasses have led to any long-term fiscal restraint. Indeed, the debt rose from 70% of GDP in fiscal 2011, the year the Budget Control Act was passed as part of the resolution of the 2011 debt ceiling crisis, to 79% of GDP in 2019, the year before COVID. And this increase in borrowing reflects, at least in part, the tax cuts enacted in 2017. Second, I think much more importantly, the questions of how to address our long-term fiscal sustainability problem we need to decide when changes should be made, what's the mix of spending and tax increases we need, and which specific policies are best. These are complicated questions and they require careful deliberation. These types of fundamental policy decisions shouldn't be made in a hurry because the economy is being held hostage. Instead, Congress should confront tax and spending issues directly, not as a byproduct to lifting the debt ceiling. In sum, the debt ceiling should be abolished. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Shainer. I now recognize uh, Ms. Russell uh, for five minutes. Please unmute your microphone and begin when you're ready. Thank you, Chairman Yamrath, Ranking Member Smith, and other members of the committee. My name is Lawana Russell. I'm the founder and president of Business Management Associates, a human capital firm with approximately 60 employees. I'm also the chair of the board of the Small Business Majority, a national small business organization that empowers Americans entrepreneurs. I am pleased to provide insights today as to why Congress should eliminate the US debt ceiling to mitigate financial risk and uncertainty for the small business community. This is an important proposal that will better serve American entrepreneurs like me who are still trying to recover from the damaging effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. The United States is home to 32.5 million small businesses that employ 61.2 million people. 32.5 million businesses 61.2 million Americans. This makes up about half of all American employees. Needless to say, our impact on the economy is critical to the success of this country. And as you can imagine, uncertainty and risk are not welcome, especially those that could be more easily mitigated or managed like the debt ceiling. As a small business owner with more than 20 years of experience, I understand firsthand the importance of reliability and having support of government agencies in times of crisis. For example, during the 2019 government shutdown, the longest government shutdown in American history, my business lost thousands of dollars over the course of 35 days. My employees had questions. Will their jobs still be there? Will they still have the same level of benefits? Will their pay decrease to cover the loss? Similarly, I had questions. How are we going to recoup? Will these employees find other positions or will they stay with our company? In this case, the risk was a little more definitive. We anticipated the shutdown and could somewhat mitigate internally what forward happened, but the impacts were still there. But what would happen if our government were to default on its debt? This is a risk that small businesses simply cannot afford. As you well know, it has been a difficult journey over the last two years. Uncertainty has taken on a whole new meaning, and unfortunately, small businesses have taken the brunt of this new definition. At first, thankfully, BMA didn't feel the significant impact, but as days turned into weeks and weeks into months, we slowly realized that COVID-19 wasn't just a temporary crisis. BMA, like so many other small businesses, began to experience accounting and processing delays, which meant that we either weren't going to get paid or our contracts were going to be put on hold indefinitely. Obviously, my story is one example, but let's get down to some additional facts. 
A recent small business majority survey found that small businesses are still facing challenges in maintaining their operations since the onset of COVID. More than one in four of those surveyed stated that they may not survive the next six months without additional funding or market changes. 37% said their business is on the decline compared to the previous month. 37% equates to real jobs for real people with real families. I believe that we elect officials to manage resources and minimize uncertainty for small businesses and all Americans alike. Over the years, lawmakers from both sides of the aisle have used the argument of raising the debt ceiling to justify political infighting. But what is really good for the people? Every time our government gets closer to defaulting on our debt, uncertainty ensues and our, likely, our very livelihoods are threatened. Small and large businesses alike are affected. We consider ourselves the global force, yet we allow this ongoing dilemma to undermine our stance in the global markets. Imagine if the United States, a global leader, were unable to pay its own debt and make right on fiscal promises. Let us not forget the ongoing discussion and challenge for small businesses on access to capital. Defaulting on the debt limit will have severe consequences for us, higher interest rates for small business loans, even those from the Small Business Administration, Personal and small business credit cards would carry higher interest rates, harder for us to pay their debts. Stock market would be in jeopardy, jeopardy. Large businesses, everyone across the overall economy. Payments to contractors like me would be even more delayed, which undermines our ability to pay our employees and our vendors promptly. It could even create a precedent where banks deny us lines of credit due to the risk level. I am 100% not saying that we cannot or should not be fiscally responsible. I see it as Congress's job to teach us all the importance of doing so by setting a great example. Think about the fiscal responsibility that we teach our children. Congressional leaders must take a closer look at our budget, analyze how we are prioritizing certain expenditures and how we can get back to supporting small business. We have an opportunity here. Let's work together to stabilize the economy. Built to eliminate the debt limit is one that can largely address and reduce financial uncertainty for businesses of all sizes. I urge you to refrain from using the debt limit as a political tactic to undermine each other's political priorities. We deserve more from you than that. Small businesses have been pushed to their breaking point in the past, past two years. We can no longer bear the financial uncertainty of constant debt limit negotiations. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Russell. I now yield five minutes to our for former colleague and former director of the uh, Office of Management and Budget, Mr. Mulvaney. You have five minutes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for having me. Thank you to uh, Ranking Member Smith for the invite. It's good to see everybody. It's good to see the majority leader. I haven't seen him in a while, uh, as well as a lot of the old colleagues. It's hard to imagine that I think five years ago today, I was still one of your colleagues. I didn't realize it was the anniversary. Um, Listen, I, I'm not going to read my, my opening statement. I'm going to say just a couple of things and we can start the hearing. Um, I was talking yesterday with uh, Jeb Henseling, who all of you know, or most of you know, wrote a great um, op-ed in the Wall Street Journal back in September on this very topic. And he and I were trying to figure out the right analogy. Um, you know, was the debt ceiling, was it a smoke alarm in your house? Is it the check engine light in your car? Something that reminds you from time to time to go look at something. And then Dr. Shiner said something that I actually agree with, which is that wouldn't it be great if we could actually, you know, deal with our debt and our deficit situation directly? Um, yeah, it would be. Uh, and that's what made me think of a different analogy, which is the debt ceiling is really that buzzer that goes off when your battery is busted in your in your smoke alarm. Uh, it always goes off at an inconvenient time. It's always a pain to change it, but you always do it. It's not easy. You got to get on a ladder at two o'clock in the morning, but you do it because you know it's the right thing to do. And you do it so that you know that six months later, God forbid, you have a fire in your house, you know that the tool works. That's what the, that's what the debt ceiling is. I sit and I was listening to folks. I read all the materials from the other witnesses, some very, very smart people, some really good points made. Hope we get a chance to talk about a lot of them. But it seems like one of the overriding themes here is that you want to get rid of it because it's hard. Um, it, it's messy. It's it, it's a distraction. Uh, OK, yeah, it, it probably is. So is passing a budget. That's not easy. Um, by the way, I've been involved with several budgets. I was involved, heavily involved in the 2017 debt ceiling increase when President Trump was hard they are. You all know I know how hard they are and how messy they are and how partisan they are. Budgets are the same way. Appropes are the same way. Congress hasn't passed all 12 appropriations bills since 1996. Just because it's hard, does that mean we want to stop doing it? Um, 
I think uh, no one ran on a, on a campaign slogan that said, send me to Washington so I don't have to do anything hard, so I don't have to take any messy votes, so that I don't actually have to make any hard decisions. Um, ask yourself this, how often would you as members of Congress be talking about the debt and the deficit if not for the debt ceiling? I can't remember it ever coming up on the floor of the House when we were there outside of that. Yeah, we talked about it during some of the appropriations marks up, markups and so forth. But generally speaking, it, it never came to the forefront. That's what this debt ceiling does. And I happen to think it's, it, it does it well. Ask yourself this question. Would Congress be more or less likely to be prudent but how they manage their taxpayer dollars with or without the rule? Ask yourself this. Would our debt situation be better or worse if we didn't have the bill? Yes, we, we've not fixed it. And yes, the long-term trends are very bad, but would it be better or worse if we had not had the debt ceiling rules available to us? The bottom line I think is this, the rule's not broken. The rule's not broken. The rule does exactly what it is supposed to do. It, it forces us to have a discussion that we otherwise would not have and from time to time allows us to pass legislation that we otherwise would not pass. The debt ceiling gave us Graham Rudman Hollings. The debt ceiling gave us the Omnibus Act in 1991, which is to a balanced budget by the end of that decade. The debt ceiling gave us the Budget Control Act of 2011. Were these fixes, permanent fixes to our deficits and our debts? No, they absolutely weren't. In fact, we voted uh, as, as a body to undo a lot of, of those things as we moved forward, but we never would have had those without the debt ceiling. The rules are not broken. Congress is broken. Uh, and the reason it's so hard to do this, it, it doesn't have to be hyperbolic. There's nothing in the rule that says this has to be divisive and hyperbolic and brinksmanship. That's not in the rule. That's how you as it. That's how we addressed it as a body when I was there. The rule is not broken. Congress is not broken. Excuse me. Congress is what's broken. And I think what we should be spending our time on is fixing that. And then you fix that, you get a chance to fix the debt ceiling, get a chance to fix the appropriations process, get a chance to fix the budget process. And by doing that, you get better fiscal outcomes. So I hope we get a chance to talk all about that again today. And I really appreciate the chance to be here. It's great to see uh, so many friends and colleagues. And uh, thank you for your time. I uh, thank the gentleman for his remarks. Uh, we'll now begin the uh, question and answer portion of the hearing. Um, I defer my questioning until the end. So I now recognize uh, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Jeffries for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman for uh, convening this very important hearing. I thank all the witnesses uh, and Mr. Mulvaney, it is good to see you. Welcome back to the People's House, uh, even if it is virtual. Uh, Mr. Mulvaney, you ran the Office of Management and Budget for President Trump before becoming his chief of staff. Is that right? Uh, that's correct. I think I ran OMB for two years. I ran it from uh, to February of 17 through about uh, December of, uh, of, nine, of uh, 18. Is it fair to say that many Republicans only care about the debt and deficits when there's a Democrat in the White House? I think it's fair to say that not as many Republicans care about the debt and deficit as, as I want them to. Uh, I'll, I'll never forget, I was walking down the hallway early in my days in Congress, what we all refer to as the old bulls. I honestly can't remember his name, so I'm not shielding him. Um, and I just got there in the Tea Party wave and he looked at me and says, oh, you're Mulvaney, you're one of those fiscal hawks. And I said, yeah, and he laughed. He said, yeah, you know, y'all came around a little bit with Newton, and then you left and I was here. You were around a little bit with Reagan, you left and I was here. Now you're here and I'm here, you're gonna leave and I'm still gonna be here. There are Republicans who love spending money as just as much as Democrats do. Um, well, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Mulvaney. Uh, and I think that's consistent with what you once said, which is my party is very interested in deficits when there is a Democrat in the White House. The worst thing in the whole world is deficits when Barack Obama was the president, then Donald Trump became president and we're a lot less interested as a party. You said that on February 19th, 2020. Now in 2017, Republicans passed uh, the GOP tax scam uh, where 83 percent of the benefits went to the wealthiest one percent is that correct was that was that the official name of the bill i don't i don't remember that uh that's the informal name okay. uh, it's an affectionate <laughs> name for uh, a very interesting piece of legislation to subsidize the lifestyles of the rich and shameless uh, but in terms of that particular bill uh it's estimated that it increased deficits by 1.9 trillion dollars over a 10 or 11 year period of time is that correct 
Uh, I, I've not seen that estimate. I'm, what, what, what are you looking at, Hakeem? I actually came from the Congressional uh, Budget Office. Now, during President Trump's time in office, the national debt rose by approximately $7.8 trillion. Is that correct? Uh, I, again, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it sounds about, we, we increased the, def, the deficit considerably during the Trump administration, yes. Right, $7.8 trillion. That is a record amount over a four-year period of time. Yet despite opposing the GOP tax scam and all the other reckless spending that this country was forced to absorb, Democrats in Congress voted uh, to increase the debt ceiling three times because that is the responsible thing to do as leader Steny Hoyer indicated. But it also has become a political weapon often used with great hypocrisy, as you yourself eloquently articulated in England several years ago. And that's why I believe the responsible thing to do uh, is to move beyond it. Let me uh, ask uh, Dr. Shainer, uh, Am I correct that the United States is the only major high income industrialized nation to have a debt limit? Um, I actually don't know the history of the debt limit across countries. I think as um, Representative Hoyer said that Denmark has one, but that it's not binding, but it is very unusual uh, across countries to have this, this it's kind of weird rule that says you pass money and then you have some other law that inconsistent with, what, with the other law that you've, you've passed. And, and what was its intention uh, when it was created? So again, not an economic historian, but from what I understand it was, um, again, as uh, Representative Hoyer said, to allow Treasury more flexibility than they had um, in order to borrow money to keep the country um, rolling, so. And am I correct that debt, li debt limit is simply designed to allow the Department of Treasury basically to pay, pay the bills that Congress has already acquired? It's like if you, were not to do that, you'd be blocking the checking account from paying off the credit card bill uh, that you have already accumulated, true? Exactly. Congress passes something that says Treasury pay this person $100, and then the debt limit says what you can't. Is there any evidence to suggest that the debt limit has ever incentivized a Democratic or Republican-controlled Congress to reduce spending? This is particularly uh, apropos given what we saw explode during the Trump years, particularly in 2017 and 2018. I think if you look at the history of the debt ceiling, you will find that it has not had any material effect on uh, deficits. Um, Thank you very much. I yield back the balance of my time. Uh, gentlemen's time has expired and now recognize the ranking member, uh, Mr. Smith for 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before proceeding uh, further, my fellow Republicans on this committee and I, we sent you a letter over two months ago calling for an oversight hearing on the $2 trillion of so-called COVID-19 relief, the legislation that was signed into law in March of 2021. In our letter, Mr. Chairman, we highlighted numerous examples of, of waste and mismanagement of that funding, including millions of dollars spent to build parking lots in South Carolina, uh, millions to plant trees in New York, build golf courses in Florida, and, and it even sent Japanese citizens living in Japan and convicted prisoners $1,400 stimulus checks, not to mention the billions diverted from the COVID-19 purposes like testing supplies and the strategic national stockpile to house illegal immigrants at the Southern border. All of it, frankly, Mr. Chairman, cries out for more oversight by this committee on the administration's COVID spending. Given that the White House is re reportedly now asking for more funding to supposedly combat COVID-19, now more than ever, we ought to be holding a hearing on how the administration has spent or how they have misspent the trillions already handed to it. Particularly, Mr. Chairman, if we are going to take the time today to talk about how to loosen congressional oversight over spending. I'd like to ask unanimous consent to include this letter we sent to you in the record for today's hearing, Mr. Chairman. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mulvaney, great to have you. As, uh, as I'm sure you heard during your time as a 
a member of Congress, whenever there is a discussion around raising the debt limit, our Democrat colleagues predict there will be catastrophic impacts accompanying a US credit downgrade that they say will occur if, if the limit is not raised quickly and without debate. They are eager to cite the S&P downgrade of US credit that occurred at the time of the 2011 debt limit debate, claiming that downgrade was a consequence of the debate and discussions that occurred. The premise being that negotiating about how to handle America's debt crisis, rather than just thoughtlessly lifting the debt limit. Is it is itself a threat to our credit rating? Mr. Mulvaney, can you speak to the circumstances surrounding that decision by S&P at that time and what they said some of the reasoning was behind that decision? Sure, Jason, because I, I was there in 11 uh, during, the, during the, uh, the showdown over the debt ceiling. I remember the S&P crisis, uh, the S&P downgrade, um, I don't know how many members of this committee were here at that time, but yeah, it's always surprised me how that history has been revised. The history has been portrayed that it was because of the fight, because of the debt ceiling fight that we got, got the downgrade. Um, that's actually not, not true. If you go and look at the S&P uh, report, which I've got in front of me, um, I mean, I'll read sections to you. It says, we lowered our long-term rating on the U.S., because we believe that prolonged controversy over raising statutory debt ceiling and the related fiscal policy debate indicate that further near-term progress containing the growth in public spending, especially or in reaching an agreement on raising revenues, is less likely than we previously assumed. We also believe that the fiscal consolidation plan that Congress and the administration so they downgraded us after the deal, the one they agreed to this week falls short of the amount we believe is necessary to stabilize the government debt burden by the middle of the decade, and we go on to say that our opinion is that elected officials remain wary of tackling the structural issues effectively address the rising U.S. public debt burden in a manner consistent with the triple A. Republicans and Democrats have only been able to agree to relatively modest savings on discretionary spending while delegating the select committee decisions on more comprehensive measures. It had nothing to do with the fight and everything to do with a compromise that came out we got downgraded. The S&P knew that we didn't solve our problem. Did we Did we kick the can down the road? Yes. And they were finally holding us uh, to account over it. So uh, I, I know that that's not the history that gets told in the press. I know it's not the history that gets told in politics. That the reason we got downgraded and could get downgraded again is not because we bicker over the debt ceiling. We always raise the debt ceiling. Everybody knows we're going to raise the debt ceiling. It's what we do. The question becomes, what do we do as part of raising the debt ceiling? Do we spend less? Or do we spend more? Keep in mind, it and Mr. Hoyle will remember this, the Democrats only agreed to, to help us raise the debt ceiling in the Trump administration if we spent more money. So the leverage works both ways, depending upon who's in charge. Um, so the debt ceiling, again, not the problem. Congress is the problem, and changing the debt ceiling um, isn't going to make, it'll probably just make them worse. You know, Mr. Mulvaney, Congress is now facing another debt limit discussion within the next year or so, and perhaps sooner if more of the seven and a half trillion dollars in new spending House Democrats have passed becomes law. As you know, the debt limit has often been paired with spending restraints or other long term policies to rein in deficit spending, like you pointed out. But Given that the 2011 S&P downgrade was a result of the markets having no confidence that, that Washington would curb its appetite to spend, and since we are facing a new debt limit crisis end of this year, when that next conversation over the debt limit occurs, what specific reforms do you, do you think, Mick, um, that Congress should consider as part of any potential debt limit increase, apart from just abolishing the debt limit like Democrats are proposing. Um, should Congress consider bringing back caps on, on annual spending or other such policies that put into law real spending restraints? Uh, Jason, excuse me, Mr. Chairman, you know, the, my gut caps would be great, but keep in mind we did that in 2011 and then all Congress did every two years was, was raise the caps again. So even when we took those hard decisions in 2011 to do the Budget Control Act, we let ourselves out of that every two as we went forward. And as a result, the, 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 again, uh, I think it was Dr. 
uh, Shiner who mentioned that, you know, the Budget Control Act didn't really have that much impact on the long-term debt. And she's right, but it really wasn't the fault of the Budget Control Act as much as it was of Congress leaving itself of those burdens. Look, we can go through a budget if you want to. I, I can't do it in three minutes, but if you want to start with places that I actually think there's a basis for compromise, was that we had really good discussions when I was in Congress about fixing some of the entitlements. Put Medicare aside for a second, it's really, really hard to do because it's a, it's a defined contribution, undefined benefit program. But Social Security is the type of thing that needs to be fixed and can be fixed. And when I, it's not politically easily, but it's mathematically easy. All of those programs are moving towards insolvency. By the time that um, uh, I need to retire, so it probably doesn't affect him. Um, but when you and I retire, Jason, I think we're looking at automatic across the board 20 to 25 percent security payments unless Congress does something now. So yeah, is, is there stuff that we could do to get our fiscal house in order? Yes. But generally speaking, what you have to do is just you're going to spend money more wisely. You're going to spend less money when you can. And fiscal matters seriously. The debt ceiling gives you an excuse to do rid of it. I'm not sure when you're ever going to discuss uh, deficits and debts anymore. You know, Mick, you, uh, you've put together budgets both as a House member and at OMB. And uh, the gentleman from New York who spoke right before me uh, tried to criticize the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. And, and whenever you're looking at budgets, you, you have to pay attention to the revenues coming into the country. And I'd like to point out for the record that the tax revenues that came in last year was, was at 18%. Um, that's the highest in 52 years. That follows... President Trump's Tax Cut and Jobs Act. This year alone, we're right at um, 28% for this year. And that is under the Tax Cut and Jobs Act that was passed in its administration. So these higher revenues is how you put together a budget. But also something you do when put to, putting together a budget is you calculate inflation. Given, uh, Mick, that the inflation has proven not to be transitory, regardless of what Chairman Yarm says, and what the Biden administration says, if you were at the OMB today, what sort of inflationary projection might you apply when drafting the president's fiscal year 23 budget? Yeah, when he mentions that inflation is transitory, I keep asking what that means because last time I checked, life is transitory. So it could be around forever for my lifetime and it would still technically be transitory. Everything is, is transitory. Um, it's taxes. Um, you know, the, the inflation numbers are tough. I haven't gone back to look at um, the administration yet as to what their projections were for this year. For those of you who aren't familiar with this process, when you when you write a Fed, well, of course, you're, it's they the projected 2.1% for this year. That's what the project, administration projected. You have to project out for 10 years what you think the, the inflation numbers are going to do uh, and what they really need to do. I'd be curious to see. They always this week is a, is a budget due out from the from the from the administration this week? No, it was due last week. They're late again, but last year, of course, <laughs> it was the latest budget in the history of America for any president. Yeah, and they, I'd be curious to see what their what their inflation projections are. Will it be seven percent this year, and then six, and then five, or will they go back to two point one? Because when you know inflation at at a real level of five or six percent it drives deficits in a huge matter uh mr jeffries i think was correct i think that donald trump did set a record for the amount being done in any four-year term by any president but my i'd be willing to bet anybody in this committee that that number is going to be blown away uh from the four years of the Biden administration i will just uh i will just say mick um with all the with the with the budget that was proposed last year of 68 trillion dollars and all of the spending that Nancy Pelosi has done as Speaker of the House in the last three years, if you used all the taxes that have been collected since our country was founded, you couldn't even pay for all that spending. That's how unconscionable this spending is right now. Thank you, Mick, for being before our committee. Jason. Gentlemen's time has expired. I now recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Boyle, for five minutes. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for, for holding this hearing, and, and I want to thank the uh, committee as, as well. Um, as you know, my enthusiasm uh, for this issue, I've worked on it for the last uh, seven years now, so I, I appreciate uh, you and, and the committee holding this hearing. Um, and as um, Steny Hoyer, Leader Hoyer, already previewed, uh, I thank you as well as um, Senate uh, Majority Whip Durbin, 
for joining me to co-author and introduce the Debt Ceiling Reform Act, which we introduced yesterday. And, and let me uh, talk about that a little bit because something, and it's great to see uh, my good friend Mick uh, back with us. I was always sad when he got demoted to the executive branch. So it's great to see Mick uh, back home uh, with the first article uh, of the Constitution, uh, Congress. Um, Mick expressed a real um, confidence or certitude. I think he said something in effect of, well, we know we're going to raise the debt ceiling. We always raise the debt ceiling. Um, I wish I shared that 100% certainty. One of the reasons why I started working on this seven years ago is because of my increasing fear that, God forbid, because of our increasing political dysfunction, uh, at one point in the future, we will fail either by intention or more likely by accident not to raise the debt ceiling. That would be calamitous. And no, uh, Ranking Member Smith, it's not just Democrats who would point out it's calamitous. It is economists across the ideological spectrum. In fact, one thing that has always stuck with me is I recall, uh, this would have been about three, four years ago now, on the Ways and Means Committee, when I asked then Secretary Mnuchin, I asked him because I, I supported um, his push to raise the debt ceiling uh, at that point. And I said, could you describe for us what would be the consequences if Congress failed to raise the debt ceiling? And he replied, Congressman, he stuttered a little bit, he said, Congressman, the consequences would be so catastrophic, I can't even begin to describe them. That was Donald Trump's Secretary of the Treasury. And indeed, every Treasury Secretary of my lifetime of both parties has, uh, has pushed for raising the debt ceiling. So Dr. Shiner, I, I'll ask you, and just let me actually, before I turn to Dr. Shiner, let me explain real quick about my legislation, uh, the Debt Ceiling Reform Act. It actually would not eliminate the debt ceiling, but it would take it away from this increasing uh, political dysfunction that we see in Congress. It would vest in the Treasury Secretary the authority to raise the debt ceiling while still reserving to Congress the authority to overrule that decision if Congress ever wanted to exercise that authority. It would improve the mechanism and take away that uh, catastrophic possibility of one day failing to raise the debt ceiling and plummeting us into a worldwide depression. So with that, uh, let me invite in Dr. Shiner. If you wanted to uh, perhaps describe some of the consequences uh, that, that Secretary Mnuchin couldn't even imagine if we were one day to uh, fail to raise the debt ceiling. So um, back in last fall, I totally agree with you. I was not 100% sure that we weren't going, that we were going to raise the debt ceiling in time. It seemed like possible that actually we would step into the breach. And we thought quite carefully, I wrote something with my colleague, Wendy Edelberg, about what would happen if, if that occurred. And you know, there was a lot of uncertainty because we thought, I mean, clearly, if we have an impasse that lasts for any material amount of time, that is quite devastating for the economy. Um, if, if it turns out that, you know, that the federal government has to keep delaying payments, then that means that the federal government is spending much less than what it was before, and, and people's incomes are down, and that in itself has been projected to cause a recession. So the Federal Reserve has done projections. They did projections in 2011. They thought a month impasse would, would cause a short recession. So, um, a, uh, the, what we really don't know is what the whole what it would look like because you know Treasury had a plan in 2011 that they, people thought they'd follow again, which is that they'd still pay principal interest, but they would just delay payments to everybody else. They would just like wait until yeah, they had me, enough cash. Uh, yeah. And, and Dr. Shah, just because I only have nine seconds left, uh, yeah. perhaps you, you'll get a, a chance to expand upon that uh, with, with someone else. So let me just conclude with this. I, and I say sincerely to uh, my Republican colleagues on, on this committee, I think the idea that I've come up with it is not inherently liberal or conservative or Democratic or Republican. It would give Treasury secretaries of both parties this authority. And I think it's a responsible um, mechanism far better than the one we have. So I would encourage uh, my Republican colleagues to take a look at it. 
uh, to contact me if they would like to be supportive, if they'd like to offer suggestions. I do think this is something that we need to fix before it's too late. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. McClintock, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's interesting. The Democrats began the session with the budget hearing on restoring Congress's power of the purse. Now we're hearing how Democrats want to relinquish Congress's constitutional power of the purse to the executive branch to establish debt levels. This is the topsy-turvy world we've come to expect from the majority. The debt limit is a speed bump that's designed to prompt the Congress to ask what it's doing wrong when we find ourselves spending more than we're taking in in revenue. And it has worked repeatedly over the years. The Democrat witnesses who say it's had no effect on budget reforms are simply wrong. The Balanced Budget and Emergency Deficit Control Act of 1985 and its extension and the PAYGO provisions of 1997 and the Pay As You Go Act in 2010 and the Budget Control Act of 2011 they were all enacted as part of the debt ceiling negotiations. Now, it's true the debt limit is not a panacea, but it is a useful tool. And, and the crux of the problem is that in the last 10 years, while inflation and population have grown a combined 27%, revenues have grown 58%. That is with the Republican tax cuts, revenues have grown twice as fast as inflation and population combined. The problem is the spending in the same period has grown 89%. And that spending would be even higher, and with it our debt, if it wasn't for the reforms over the years that were enacted because of the debt ceiling discussions. But the Democrats don't even want to have those discussions anymore. They're proceeding on the assumption that the federal government can spend unlimited amounts of money with no consequences. And the problem with that is there are consequences. It, it turns out all of that free money is very expensive. The fact is government can't put a dollar into the economy that it first hasn't taken out of the same economy. And there are only three ways to do that. Either current taxes, which rob you of your current purchasing power, borrowing, which robs you of your future purchasing power, or printing money which robs you every time you go shopping by reducing the value of your earnings while it silently hollows out your savings and retirement funds. That's the 7.5% inflation rate that's being caused by these trillions of dollars of free government money. What that means is if you earn $50,000 a year, inflation just took $3,750 from your annual purchasing power. If you've managed to put aside $100,000 for retirement, the December inflation rate just took $7,500 of that. That's the consequence of excessive debt financed by monetary policy. And the crux of the Democrats' argument appears to be that an impasse on the debt limit risks a catastrophic default on our debt payments. You may remember that during the Obama administration, they, they argued the same thing. I introduced the Full Faith and Credit Act and then the Default Protection Act to make it crystal clear that the administration did have the full authority to prioritize payments to protect the nation's credit. They both passed the House without a single Democrat supporting them. Democrats in the Senate refused to take them up. But frankly, these measures were superfluous. The organic law that established the Treasury Department in 1789 specifically gives the Treasury Secretary the authority and responsibility to, quote, manage the revenue and support the public credit. And the GAO clearly spelled out what that means to the Senate Finance Committee way back in 1985. They said, Treasury is free to liquidate obligations and any order it finds will best serve the interests of the United States. Meanwhile, the Constitution commands that the public debt is not to be questioned. Prioritization is the practical mechanism for doing that. Most state constitutions provide first call on any revenues is to maintain and protect their sovereign credit. This is simply a canard. We discovered that even while the Obama Treasury Department was denying that they had the ability to prioritize to protect debt payments, they were actually making preparations to do so. And we also discovered documents that revealed the Federal Reserve officers were appalled when the administration denied their intention to give priority to debt payments because such statements they said ran a severe risk of panicking credit markets. That's exactly what we're hearing from the Democrats and their witnesses on this committee uh, and from this administration. Uh, and with that, uh, Mick, do you have anything to add? Uh, you know, I was gonna say, Tom, you're absolutely right. I mean, if, you, if the concern here is that we'll, we'll miss it by accident, 
then pass, then clarify prioritization. Oh, the Obama administration thought we could do it. I thought we could do it with red OMB, but some folks say that we can't. So let's clarify and say, okay, so the, the sovereign debt gets paid first. Um, you know, as, as Hensling pointed out in his in his just exempt sovereign debt from the debt ceiling. So you focus on discretionary and mandatory spending. There's all sorts of ways to address these issues without getting rid of the debt ceiling. Now, uh, one of the best four minute summaries, I, I think I've heard of this topic in a long time. I, I do miss being, uh, being there. You're back. Thanks, the gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Price for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thanks to all of our witnesses, uh, particularly happy to welcome back our former colleague, Mr. Mulvaney, and um, who for years shared the representation with me and our delegation of the, of the Carolinas. Uh, Mr. Mulvaney's offered a kind of revisionist history here this morning, and I, I want to maybe set up a chance for our other panelists, perhaps starting with Dr. Blessing, our, uh, our economic historian, but others welcome to chime in. Want to set, want to set up a, a, a dialogue regarding some of the directly relevant, I think, to assessing how the how the debt limit works in, in practice. Um, the um, Budget Control Act uh, of uh, 2011 was the direct result of the uh, of the of the debt ceiling debate of that year. It um, uh, I. I, I would agree it was a gift that kept on giving. I, I don't share the positive assessment of the way it worked in practice. But but first of all, Dr. Blessing, this, uh, this notion that the S&P downgrade that came after that protracted debate, that it really had very little to do with the debt ceiling, that the, the, the S&P downgrade was about, uh, would, would might have, I, I guess Mr. Albany is saying it, it probably would have been imposed even without the debt ceiling debate because it really had to do with our levels of uh, of indebtedness, so is, would that be your understanding of, of that downgrade and what precipitated it? For the credit agencies were, were threatening downgrade from earlier in the year. They had also threatened downgrade in previous episodes of debt ceiling brinksmanship, including 1999, uh, 1995 to 96. Uh, so this is uh, something that they've uh, threatened in connection specifically with debt ceiling uh, problems in the past. It was directly relinked to the debt ceiling prospect that the prospect that was posed of default. Yes. All right. Now the gift, the gift on giving, the Budget Control Act. Um, we, uh, the Budget Control Act was a was a symbolic gesture. It it put forward, put forth uh, for ten years budget ceilings that were were kind of talking points. They they were totally unrelated to. Uh, budget reality, appropriations reality, but they did have an effect. They did have an effect because for 10 long years, we had drama every other year. We, we re required uh, four two-year budget agreements, but it didn't come uh, easily. It came at the end of the budget cycle, a lot of drama, a lot of threat and shutdowns, and then finally an adjustment to, uh, to more realistic uh, budget numbers. Would, would you regard that as a as a positive history, I mean, there there is a case to be made, of course, for budget parameters that uh, that last for uh, two years, maybe even five years. But do you require a um, a budget ceiling uh, showdown to uh, to get that result or to adopt those kinds of parameters? The general understanding of sequestration is that it's really troubled and already troubled appropriations process, particularly over the past decade. It's also been difficult for the same, same, exact same reasons the first time we tried it. Uh, it's both uh, difficult for appropriators as well as it uh, doesn't substantially uh, lend itself to um, you know, controlling the debt. Right, so the Budget Control Act, uh, it, in a sense, disrupted that process rather than facilitated uh, a kind of orderly budget uh, process. Uh, well, then let's, let's think about the uh, Trump tax cuts, the, um, the, uh, the kind of adjustments that were required in the debt ceiling uh, in the last decade. Is it true that the Trump tax cuts required uh, major adjustments in the debt ceiling? And is it uh, not true that, uh, going back here to what Mr. Hoyer said, is, is it not true that the Democrats tried to break the fever on this? Tried to say we shouldn't be uh, making this kind of a showdown purely political showdown every time we need to raise the debt ceiling. 
raised it, in fact, three times, cooperated in that. And so it was an unpleasant surprise um, in the current administration when Republicans reverted to that kind of um, uh, adamant uh, refusal. What would you say about that? Uh, vis a -vis your first question, um, the, uh, when Congress voted on the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, the estimated cost was $1.5 trillion over 10 years. It was uh, rescored to be more than that. I believe CBO rescored it to be about uh, $2 trillion over 10. So uh, that, in addition to all other spending, both uh, tax expenditures as well as appropriations, is going to add to uh, the debt ceiling. Um, Vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, partisan partisanship um, and uh, difficulties raising the debt ceiling, uh, both parties over a very large historical span of time have both played political hardball with it. Um, we're in the most dangerous period right now from 2011 uh, to the present uh, time, um, which uh, has been particularly exaggerated because default is act actually at risk. And I think we've all seen what happened um, this past December with that. Well, just to re revisit my question, did Democrats uh, cooperate in raising the debt ceiling three times over the past decade? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Gentlemen, Chairman. Yep, the gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Smucker, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for uh, holding this hearing. I'd like to thank the ranking member as well. Uh, I have just a few points I'd like to make. Uh, the first in response to the... Um, charges that the TCJA uh, contributed to the deficit. Uh, now, I completely agree that during the Trump administration, the, the debt increased uh, significantly more than uh, I would certainly have liked to have seen. But it wasn't the TCJA, uh, because if, if you're arguing that that contributed, you essentially would be saying that the tax cuts that came as a part of that resulted in less revenue which was absolutely not the case. In fact, revenues were higher uh, every single year after 2017. And in 2021, uh, they're 22% higher uh, than in 2017. So it wasn't as a result of the TCJA, which by the way, worked very, very well in bringing lots of jobs, lifting people out of poverty and so on, but did not contribute to less revenue. Uh, what contributed to the debt increase was more spending. Uh, and based on the record of the Biden administration in its first year, we're going to see far higher uh, debt increases during his administration if we continue on this same track. Now, uh, on whether we should have a debt limit, uh, I think it's a good discussion, and I think we're having a good discussion here today. But in some ways, it feels sort of tone deaf to me. The Americans are experiencing the highest inflation in in 40 years, it's affecting their pocketbooks. I hear it throughout my district, uh, everywhere I go, and I'm sure you all do as well. And Americans are gonna see this hearing as the Democrats essentially asking for a blank check to spend even more and contribute more to these inflationary policies. So it's sort of tone deaf. What we really should be talking about is the real problem that we have $30 trillion in debt. It's unfathomable. And in fact, if you do a quick calculation, I think the debt went up just during the time of this hearing by another $120 million. Uh, think about that. We know how it ends when countries overspend, overpromise, and spend money we don't have. And we're starting to see the effects of that. When, so, so you know, back to the discussion on the debt limit, I, I get uh, the concerns with it. But when else will we talk about, in fact, the entire time that we've been here in Congress, I don't remember much discussion about the problem with the debt. I don't remember much discussion about spending much more money than we have. The debt limit at least forces us to talk about it. And I'd, I'd like to ask other members here, I'd like to ask the Democrat leadership, when will be the right time to talk about this excessive spending? When will be the right time to talk about the impact that the debt's going to have on future generations and on our economy in, 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 in America. When will it be? At least when we're talking about the debt increase, it's one time, the only time, frankly, since I've been here, when we have at least some semblance of these discussions. And so 
Uh, you know, I, my, my fellow representative, uh, Representative Boyle from Pennsylvania, uh, you know, love to work with him to find solutions to ensure that we put our country on, on a different track. But it feels like, like talking about the debt limit is, yeah, is would, sidestepping the, the would, uh, uh, major would my issue fellow, that would my, since he invoked me, my fellow Pennsylvanian yield just for a second? Uh, I'll, uh, I, I, don't, I don't want to give up my five minutes, but it's up to the chairman. You can yield your time. Yeah, I, I'll I, just well, say, go ahead. I'll just say briefly, I'm happy to, to work with, with you or, or anyone uh, else on this issue in good faith. I will point out the argument, though, that the debt ceiling is somehow ne the drama around the debt ceiling. And right, the I'm going to need to retake my time because I didn't hear the chairman say I, he would give me. An I'll, give, I'll give you. I'll give you. OK. Advice. All right. Fine. All right. Thank you. Thank you. We have a deal. See, um, I, I'll say this. The, the idea that it's only the debt ceiling drama that's needed for us to talk about deficit and debt is not accurate. I would point out 1992, Ross Perot built an entire independent presidential campaign, the most successful since Teddy Roosevelt got 19 percent. Literally, his entire campaign was about deficit and debts and him hosting infomercials showing charts. And that wasn't at all brought about by uh, the debt ceiling issue. So with that, I'll yield back. Yeah, and, and I'd like to thank you for that uh, comment, because I think a real discussion around our debt and, and, and the future of our financial, financial responsibility in America is what is needed. So I'd love to have that substantive discussion. But until we have other mechanisms that provide accountability, I have concerns about removing uh, the, the uh, debt limit. So you know, we should be talking about a balanced budget. How can we get to a balanced budget in 10, 20 years from now? These are the kind of discussions that, that I think we should be having. And we should be talking about redoing the Budget Act of 1974 to, to, to insert more accountability in the process here uh, in Congress. So again, love to have those conversations with you. I'm concerned about just the interest payments. And Director Mulvaney, you know, it, we're going to see rising interest payments. It's already 9% of the budget. This is going to crowd out other obligations, other priorities. Do you have any concern with that? And what do you see that trajectory being over the next? Uh, right, Mick can answer. So? The, you can answer the question in your time. I mean, I'm not very good at math, but I mean, I dollars. You, you, if interest rates are, you know, 6%, you're looking at $1.8 trillion in interest payments. I mean, that's, it's a huge number. You're already looking at interest payments, I think that are bigger than uh, the, every, um, uh, every appropriations bill except defense. It's, it's, it's a huge number and it's only going to continue to get bigger. Thank you, Mr. Thanks. Chairman, for your generosity there. Absolutely. And gentlemen's time has expired. I now recognize the gentlelady from Illinois, Ms. Chikowski, for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, for having this hearing. Um, Mr. Mulvaney, you said, you know, that's what we do. We pass the debt ceiling. Um, we do it every time. Um, and so what I'm hearing is that this is really a message opportunity. And I see it as a very, very political opportunity to, to raise this question at a time when so many Americans and businesses um, are at, uh, at risk and very nervous about what happens. And uh, my understanding um, from, I, I think it was Dr. Blessing saying that uh, we don't have any real evidence that that particular conversation or that threat has resulted in um, a reducing of the, the spending of, of the United States. And there are many, many opportunities. We have um, committees that deal with this, not just the Appropriations Committee, um, but you know we have lots of committees that could hold hearings, et cetera. And I think it's really cynical um, to say that. And I wanted to um, talk to um, uh, uh, Ms. Luana Russell about um, small businesses. You know, you, you talked about in, uh, uncertainty, but I wondered if you could go into to more detail about what that means. Let, let, for example, let, let me say, if you're planning to expand or buy, a, a, you know, another outlet or raise the wages of your workers or get um, uh, uh, access to capital, are these things affected when the question of the debt ceiling is, uh, is looming? Yes, yes, thank you so much for the question. They are because people tend to stop. So if you're working with a bank and you're working with uh, a financer, especially when you're looking at access to capital, which already for small businesses is, is a very difficult process, then 
uh, organizations just stop because they have fear. They don't know. They have uncertainty. Small businesses may see more of a risk. So while you're in a process to expand your business, to create um, tools that help your customers move forward, you will end up with a stop and then your business suffers because you cannot move forward. You have to kind of stay where you are and your growth is hindered. Thank you. You know, I, I say it's cynical because, you know, I was on the Simpson Bowles um, Commission. It was a commission over a decade ago talking about um, how we should deal with, with issues of debt. One of the uh, major suggestions, fortunately it didn't pass, was to cut social security. Entitlements were on the, on the table. And so when you talk about the, you know, the, the debt set, that's a reasonable conversation. But when you say that um, the consequence could be um, by not raising it, Social Security actually being cut, um, uh, Medicare, Medicaid being, being cut. Don't, don't make any mistakes. People get nervous about that and they should. And that anxiety, even though you say, oh, well, that's what we do, we always pass it, um, is a real problem. Let's find other venues. I'm just wondering if I uh, could ask um, Dr. Shaman to talk about real life consequences um, to businesses, et cetera, um, and investors by, from the, um, the, the debt ceiling. Oh, I, did I just run out of time? No, I have a minute, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so I think we've seen that investors clearly react to the prospect of a debt ceiling and you see rates on treasuries that are gonna mature right around the time the debt ceiling might bind rising. You know, we haven't, we've luckily so far not seen anything that has lasted a very long time. And so we've seen inklings of what would happen, but we haven't seen, you know, the, you know, the, the thing that we're most worried about is that going over the cliff. But clearly, I think um, you're right that everything's going to seize up because it just creates a whole bunch of uncertainty for businesses, but for people too. Am I getting my social security check in time? It may be that 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 eventually I will get it, but it might be two weeks late, three weeks late. That's a very big cost to impose on people. When you're, when you're going to go fix it later anyhow, it's just like this own goal, right? There's no reason to put the economy through this when we know you're going to, you're going to, the only thing to do is going to be to raise the debt ceiling. You know, we have shut down the government before for a time, and we've seen all the public services stop. We have seen such a halting in the ability of get ordinary people ordinary people to get things done. So to have this conversation, let's find another way. This does not make sense and it's very hurtful. And I yield back. Gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Carter for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank all the witnesses for being here. Mick, it's always good to see you, my friend. I'm glad you're here and glad you're doing what you're doing. You know, the premise of this hearing is absurd. I, I can't believe we're actually having a hearing to talk about doing away with the debt limit. You gotta be kidding me. I mean, it, it's, it's obvious the negative consequences of out of control spending and what they're having. Inflation is at a 40 year high right now. We realize that a 40 year high. And instead of debating whether we should have a debt limit, we ought to be debating the real consequences that tax, that spending cuts should have in, on our debt scene. This is ridiculous. Our debt's not going away. Folks, I opened my small business on November 21st, 1988. I borrowed money for inventory. I borrowed money to get me started. I, I did not get a salary for two years, nothing whatsoever. I set out to retire my debt and I did that. The first thing I did is I retired my debt. Then I retired my mortgage. I haven't owed anybody anything since 1994. This is ridiculous that we have this kind of debt in our country, and it's not sustainable. We've seen it happen over history, over time, what it's done to countries. You know, some people talk about Japan and their enormous debt to GDP ratio. Well, folks, look at Japan's GDP growth rate is abysmal, and similar things are happening right now in Italy. And some of you argue that the interest rates are lower than the growth rate, and we can continue to roll over debt, borrowing new money to pay interest on old money. That is simply ridiculous. This is unsustainable. And who's going to be paying this? 
my children, your children, my grandchildren, your grandchildren. This is intergenerational theft. We have got to stop this. And, and, and to debate stopping one of the only things that makes us even think about it has been pointed out here by Mr. Mulvaney and by others. The only time we think about this is when it come up against the debt limit. And Mr. Mulvaney is right. That's the only time we do anything about it. And it does result in good fiscal policy. It does. Mr. Mulvaney, I wanna ask you, CBO has noted that rising debt will result in less private investment and lower output and outcome is a and a lower standard of living for Americans. In fact, their projections show that the long-term impact of debt rising to 200% of GDP, which is where we are headed with this budget as it brings us to 117%, is a $9,000 annual income loss for Americans. A $9,000 annual income loss. Mr. Mulvaney, are you concerned that the massive growth and debt will crowd out other spending and result in negative economic impacts? Yeah, thanks, uh, Mr. Carter. Thanks, buddy. It's good to see you. It's, uh, I think we're all familiar with the term. Honestly, I think you're seeing some of it now, um, you're already starting to see, I think one of the many reasons we're experiencing inflation is because the government has become so big. Um, and, and yeah, I, I do worry about that in the near term and in the long term. Um, this whole concept that, you know, the debt ceiling is the problem is, is just befuddling to me. I, I heard um, uh, Dr. Shiner mentioned that, that no, no good has come of it, but go down the list of all we've done in the past um, you know, I, I mentioned Graham Rudman, I mentioned the 1996, 1991 Act, the 2011 Act, Mr. McClinock did the whole list that goes back even further than that. Ask yourself this, what would you have done on fiscal um, policy if not for the debt ceiling? I mean, show me a couple of pieces of legislation dealing with reducing spending and getting the fiscal house in order that wasn't tied to the debt ceiling. And your point, Mr. Carter, is a good one. I, I wish my Democrat friends would see it from the same perspective, which is, yeah, it, it crowds out private sector spending, but it also crowds out other government spending. If you want money to spend on other government programs, it won't be there because it's going to go to pay down the debt. Um, so even if even if we disagree about how government should spend money, uh, I, I wish we could agree that we'd rather spend it on doing things than paying off debt in the past. Um, and it worries me that people don't look at that side of it. The, the interest payments by themselves are getting ready to be the largest single line item in our, in our budget outside of, uh, of entitlements, and that's a problem. Just real quick, Mick, I want to ask you one one other thing. If we were to reverse our fiscal trajectory and put the federal budget on a sustainable course, what would be some of the positive economic in effects? Uh, I, I think you'd see less inflation. I think you'd see more private investment. One of the good things that came from the, our Tax Cuts Act was we encourage private investment so you get growth without inflation. You got great growth right now, but you got it with inflation, which is sort of you know uh, running on a treadmill. So there's all sorts of benefits that come from spending more money in the private sector and spending less in the government sector. Great. Thank you so much. And I yield back. Uh, gentlemen's time has expired. And I yield five minutes to the gentleman from New York, Mr. Morelli. Mr. Morelli, are you there? Don't hear from him. So I'll yield five minutes to uh, the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Shu. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Russell, I wanted to expand on Congressman Member uh, Jan Schakowsky's questions about small business. I am a member of the House Small Business Committee, so I understand how the U.S. government's small business lending programs underpin so much of our economy, uh, supporting business growth and, and employment. But what many of my colleagues may not realize is that the SBA's loan guarantee programs frequently operate at zero subsidy. And that means that despite offering billions of dollars in government backed loans to small businesses that otherwise would not secure affordable financing on the private markets, these programs typically require no appropriations from Congress. They don't cost our taxpayers anything. But a breach in the debt ceiling would be catastrophic for these programs, which do not even contribute to the federal debt. Even if SBA were to find a way to continue offering loans, 
they would require exorbitantly high interest rates because the government would have no other way to guarantee the loans. So could you spend some time talking about how these programs contribute to the small business economy and discuss the potential impacts to the lending environment if SBA could no longer offer low interest loans? Thank you so much for that question. It's really, really important to understand how that little ecosystem works, right? Because SBA works with many banks across the country to work with small businesses. And those are banks that are taking on uh, the guarantees from SBA and understanding how to work with small businesses specifically. And that's not necessarily federal contracting small businesses. It is all small businesses across the board. So when you remove that, then you're talking about the mom and pop organizations. You're talking about small businesses that are in high technology. You're talking about such a huge part of the American economy. You know, in my comments, we talked about 32 million small businesses. That's a huge number of American workers where that understanding of having some level of support from the Small Business Administration is critical to that business getting up and develop. Even for the gentleman speaking earlier about how he started his small business and now he's out of debt. Well, that's important to understand because so many small businesses are starting. I started my business without debt at all. I started my business at my kitchen table with 500 bucks, right? And so while some have that opportunity, others may not have that opportunity. And so it's our responsibility to give them that opportunity because we know and understand that small business is the undergird of this entire economy. SBAs and their ability to fund the small businesses to get these ideas off the ground, it's incredible. Yeah, well, thank you for that. Dr. Blessing, I wanted to uh, discuss the impacts that debt ceiling hostage taking has had on government's most important and basic functions, including the ability to collect revenue and promptly disperse refunds during tax season. Debt ceiling standoffs, including the one per perpetrated by the Republicans in 2011, have not had any impact on reduced federal spending, but instead have allowed for Republicans to defund crucial government services while spending more on their own priorities like tax cuts for the rich. Now, that's why the IRS's operating function is 20% lower today, uh, even when adjusted for inflation. And this is despite federal spending increasing uh, between 2010 and 2019. Defunding the IRS has led to a tax gap as high as $1 trillion annually, which means even more lost revenue to reduce the deficit. So the result is delayed tax refunds, overburdened staff, and more difficulty getting much needed assistance during the busy crunch before tax day. And any similar stories can be told for similar uh, essential government functions. So can you talk about the impact that debt ceiling fights have had on essential government services like revenue collection and have these service cuts led to deficit reduction? Uh, you, uh, you you make a good point with uh, drawing out uh, all of these different elements that you put together uh, connected to the debt, uh, debt ceiling standoffs. Um, I, and underfunding the IRS is an incredibly important problem that we should definitely uh, focus on. Um, you know, when we have these different debt ceiling standoffs, when we underfund these different services, um, you know, there's there are real costs uh, to uh, to the government and to our ability to uh, to collect what's on the books. Um, you know, it's not it's not a tax raise. It's it's simply you know collecting what's on, on the books and the tax gap. Uh, should be a really low-hanging fruit item uh, for reformers who are looking to, to kind of build a coalition uh, for uh, you know ways to uh, to start recouping some some revenue in a serious way. Gentlewoman, time has expired. <clears throat> now recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Klein, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've been listening over the past uh, hour, and I'm got to say this disconnect that's going on right now is profoundly disturbing. Uh, between one side that wants to pretend that there's nothing wrong, that we can continue to proceed as we have with spending, record spending levels, record deficits, record levels of debt, and that we don't need to worry about debt limits anymore. And the other side, which actually wants to have a frank and honest conversation about the looming crisis that we're facing right now. 
Uh, Director Mulvaney, thank you for being here. Do you believe we should be focused on stabilizing current important programs like Social Security and Medicare to make sure we can maintain them or on expanding these programs and creating a bunch of new programs on top of them? Uh, Mr. Klein, thank you very much for the question. It's an easy answer. Yeah, come to depend on Social Security and Medicare and, and Medicaid. Um, faced with that automatic, and let's be clear, for, and I know you folks know this as well as anybody, but for folks who might be watching this, those cuts are automatic. Social Security, for example, is not allowed to borrow money. It can only operate with the funds that it has. A, that it runs out of the, the money that's in the trust fund, um, it's going to have to unilaterally re I, last time I looked at it, which was three or four years ago, it was twenty-two percent. That you want to talk about something that would be a shock to the system, you want to, would upset everything from small business to just social cohesion. Take Social Security and cut it twenty-five percent across overnight. Um, those are the types of things you should be looking. at. How do you shore up those programs before you look at doing new ones? I know, assume you know we'll end up spending the money at some point in the future, but you know sooner or later people might stop lending you money or might not be happy with you printing more money. It's prudent to take care of the existing programs that help people before you start talking about expanding or creating new ones. Right. Uh, the Social Security trustees project that the trust funds will become depleted in 2033. Uh, although the two funds are legally separate, they're often considered in combination. And uh, the trustees project that the combined Trust funds will be depleted in 2034. They projected they projected last year that the combined trust funds uh, would become insolvent because incoming tax revenue would be sufficient to pay only about 78% of scheduled benefits. Uh, you have essentially conflicting laws under the Social Security Act. Beneficiaries would still be legally entitled to their full scheduled benefits. However, the Anti-Deficiency Act prohibits government spending in excess of available funds, so the Social Security Administration would not have legal authority to pay full Social Security benefits on time. Dr. Shiner, you mentioned that there might potentially, if a debt ceiling weren't increased, be a delay of a week or two in a check. Wouldn't this be much, much worse than a delay of a week or two uh, of, a, of a Social Security check? Oh, definitely this would be much worse, but the debt ceiling doesn't really have anything to do with it. Right, and so the question is, what do we do to put Social Security on a sounder footing? And then, frankly, the, this this kind of rule that they couldn't pay out money is very similar to a debt ceiling. It's like the people are are entitled to the money, but the Treasury not allowed to pay them. Social Security Administration not allowed to pay them. But you so, would agree, but you're reclaiming my time, that that if we can do something to set Social Security on a firmer foundation uh, and a and a solid fiscal footing, uh, that uh, the need to increase the debt ceiling would reduce. Uh, on a, on a similar scale. It depends what we do. I mean, you can imagine changing that rule and allowing general revenues to be used for social security and then thinking about a more gradual deliberative process. So it depends on what you did. Okay, thank you. Director Mulvaney, uh, similar question, modern monetary theory or MMT, using the word theory loosely, uh, proponents insist that debt doesn't matter because the government can never run out of money. Uh, we can always print more. Many of my colleagues on the other side are proponents of MNT and believe an increasing federal debt is essentially a free lunch. Uh, do you believe that policies based on MMT would be harmful to the economy? And what would you expect uh, that to be the impact on inflation, which is already a problem? Yeah, you know, we heard the term earlier, I think when uh, the majority leader was talking about a de facto default, that, you know, when, you're, when you don't pay money, you're, you, you've appropriated, it's a de facto default. If, if I borrow $100 from you, right, I expect $100 back. But if you pay me back in money that's only worth 50 cents, is that a de facto default as well? And that's what monetary, modern monetary, monetary theory sort of looks at, which is just we can print as much money as we possibly want. My, my problem with, with MMT, Mr. Klein, is that it's, it's right until it's not. Certainly, I'm sympathetic. I mean, there's been folks like me saying that the end would be was nigh for 30 years. I mean, back during Reagan, we were worried about the debt and the deficits, right? And it hasn't come up to bite us yet. Uh, I feel sometimes like a guy on the corner standing up holding the sign saying, you know, repent, the, the end is near. Sooner or later, though, I'm going to be right. Um, but the MNT works until it doesn't. And I'm not really sure how you get out of the box after you've printed all of that money or borrowed all of that money how do you then get it back? You don't. So you either deal with uh, dramatic economic slowdowns, inflation, uh, loss of trust in the system. Nothing good comes from MMT. You have a devaluation of your currency and your economy is in shambles. 
I, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Gentleman's time, gentleman's time has expired. Now I yield five minutes to the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for uh, this hearing. Uh, let me um, just uh, place in the record uh, that the debt ceiling is a fixture, a some would say figment of your imagination in terms of its validity for uh, making us fiscally sound and responsible. It is obviously something that uh, the Congress uh, delegated uh, the authority uh, to the executive branch uh, in terms of paying our bills, but then place a ceiling or limit on the total amount of the debt that could be outstanding. Um, it has no effect, as has been said, often on federal spending or the amount we need to borrow. It only restricts the Treasury's Department's ability to honor financial uh, commitments. In fact, what I would argue is that it creates havoc uh, and the havoc can be enormously uh, difficult to address. So I wanna pose these questions uh, in particular. And I wanna start Ms. Russell with you and thank you so very much for being here. Um, I'd like to um, say that uh, my life has been spent on championing small businesses because I very much agree with your testimony. You are the economic engine of this nation. And I just want to recite 32.5 million small businesses and growing, and particularly women-owned businesses, though they have been impacted severely by the pandemic, um, and then 61.2 million people. So give me your sense of havoc being created by a debt ceiling on average working Americans. And my time is short, so if you can be succinct so I can uh, ask questions uh, to others. Thank you very much, and thank you for your testimony. Thank you so much for the question. Yes, I mean, so we have to remember that a business is made up of people, and people make up the communities, and the communities are made up of other small businesses, and we are all that ecosystem that continue to thrive off of each other. So when one element, and we keep talking about this as if it is one element and one little piece of something, this piece of something impacts the entire ecosystem of small businesses. If I am not going to work, then that means my cleaners is not going to have payment. My coffee shop isn't going to have payment. The place I go to lunch isn't going to have payment. The place where I would take my child isn't going to have payment. It is an entire ecosystem that we have to consider that is disrupted every time we decide that we're going to use the debt ceiling as a poker chip in a political discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Blessing. All kinds of havoc have been proposed. Uh, our children, our grandchildren's, uh, our grandchildren, our grandchildren's children are then going to be loaded down with debt. Does a debt ceiling make a difference on being loaded down with debt? And then, could you speak to the debt ceiling being lifted, modified, on the impact of we won't be able to pay Social Security, we won't be able to provide for Medicare and Medicaid, which are obviously very uh, strong anchors of survival uh, for uh, Americans. I've got constituents who get the $700 check, and that is the only thing they get to survive on. Dr. Blessing? Uh, excellent questions. Um, the debt ceiling is not functioned to effectively control debt. Uh, to answer your first question, um, you know, there's, uh, and, you know, in, in terms of the importance of continuing to pay for Social Security, uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, this is not something that is uh, you know, if, if there are so many different reforms that we could make to the debt ceiling that would be really productive, uh, whether it's abolishing it or something very clean like the newly introduced Boyle Bill. Um, and, you know, Social Security is not connected to uh, the abolition of the debt ceiling. Dr. Shiner, let me uh, ask you the question of havoc and what happens um, if, uh, wouldn't it uh, give an opportunity for Congress to be more responsible because they could remove from their decision making political shenanigans. But let me also say that I'm glad to see my good friend, Mick Mulvaney. He might want to comment. He wants Congress to be better. Removing the debt ceiling might get us at the table of compromise and engagement. Dr. Schreiner, uh, we want to be fiscally responsible, not create a political explosion. Dr. Schreiner, and maybe yeah, Mick, yeah. if we have the time. 
So I think apart from the costs of, of the debt ceiling, that there are the political costs, which is it is a, a distraction that doesn't, doesn't address the real problems that we have. And it just creates political uh, you know, disagreement and increases political polarization and frankly, makes people not believe in our country and our institutions when they're hearing this bickering about whether or not you're going to pay your bills. And so when we think about what we need to do to move forward to address our long problems, it's not only just Congress, it's the whole American people that have to be part of the solution. And this kind of bickering gets in the way and makes us think like they're just like having these internal fights that make no sense. Chairman Mick. Um, yeah. Wouldn't it make us Maybe better? You want to take a shot at that? Yeah, real so, quickly. I, I, listen, I, I think you got a much better argument if you're doing it anyway. If you if you're sitting down anyway outside of the boundaries of the, of the debt ceiling to talk about fiscal responsibility, and you've done that for a couple of years, then you come back and say, look, we don't need the debt ceiling because we're doing it anyway. I think right now you get rid of the debt ceiling, you haven't really satisfied, certainly haven't satisfied me and many of my colleagues here that you'd have those discussions, but for the debt ceiling. So yeah, listen, I, I, I'm open for that discussion, but I think um, you know you got to prove first that you can sit down and have those those talks in a in a reasonable fashion. Well, I'm glad you're open for that discussion because I think we need to move to eliminating the debt ceiling and let's see how Congress can, can behave on the better half of the American people. I think we can do that. Mr. Chairman, thank you for yielding. Uh, unfortunately, I have to yield back. Thank you so very much. <laughs> <laughs> gentlemen's time has expired. Now rec recognize the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Feenster, for five minutes. Oh, thank you, uh, Chairman Yarmouth and Ranking Member uh, Smith. Uh, this uh, this hearing has been very interesting. You know what? Let's just look at it this way. It's all about accountability. <laughs> accountability, people. The federal government being accountable to we the people. We are government. And yet I often think that you, all other people think, oh, government's in D.C. No, it's not. It's we the people. We are government, and this hearing to abolish the debt limit completely flies in the face of every family, of every business. Think about this. Every family's got a debt ceiling. There's only so much that we can spend. We have a credit card debt limit. Our banks say, hey, this is all that you can, we can loan you out. All right? Every day, our businesses and our families deal with a debt limit, and yet we think we're above that. We think that oh, we don't need this debt limit anymore because it doesn't make a difference. Oh, it makes a difference to our families and it makes a difference to our businesses. I just think this is absolutely shameful. I really do. You know, we have $30 trillion in debt. We spent $7.5 trillion with agencies that we can't spend fast enough. We have 7.5% inflation, highest in 40 years. And yet today in the budget committee, we're addressing this little thing, this one single law that forces Congress to acknowledge to acknowledge the damage that we're doing to runaway spending. I don't, I don't understand it. This is so wrong. Mr. Mulvaney, the Federal Reserve has shifted from, from inflation being transitory to an expectation that they will increase interest rates uh, in the coming months. The rate increases might go as high as 4% uh, before this is all done. If the Federal Reserve continues to increase interest rates, how does that affect the interest on our national debt? And could this put us in a debt spiral? Yeah, in fact, thanks for the question because we used to talk about this when I was on the committee was that you end up in a circumstance, was the, the Federal Reserve during the Obama administration actually sort of encouraging us to borrow more money? I heard President Obama make the argument when interest rates are so low, we should be borrowing more money. That's when you should borrow it. Of course, that, that, that applies in a world where we actually have to pay back debt, which we never do. Um, but did the Federal Reserve sort of make it easier for us to borrow money because there was no consequences to our actions? Yes, uh, they certainly did. And if interest rates do go up, then you're going to start to see those consequences. Again, I come back to this, this idea that you would think that everybody could agree that there's better things to spend money on than interest. But at the 4%, by the way, uh, Mr. Feenstra, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't bother me. I'm old enough. I'm older than I look. I mean, I remember when interest rates were, you know, on mortgages were 14, 16, 18%. You get that on on thirty trillion dollars worth of debt, um, and you've got a real problem. In fact, you have to ask yourself: Would the Federal Reserve actually have the nerve, the will, to raise interest rates much past four percent if they needed to, recognizing the impact that has on the uh, on the on the on the Treasury? That's exactly right, and, and I, I'm glad you pointed that out because when we have the debt ceiling, these are the things that come out. Uh, these are decisions that we have to make. You know, the Congressional Budget Office projects by 2031 that as much as 15 to 18% of our money will go to interest rates. 
by 2051, close to 50% of our, our money coming in, our revenue coming in will go to strictly interest. And then we talk about Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, that's looking to go bankrupt. But no, we don't want to talk about that because it's inconvenient because, oh, it, it, it hurts. You know what? I think this is the most important topic that we should be talking about today of what does our future look like? And yet we want to bury it in the sand and we don't want to go down this path of, of holding each other accountable. You know what? Our families do. Our businesses do. I think our government needs to also. Thank you. And I yield back. Gentleman yields back. I now recognize um, the gentleman from California, Mr. Peters, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I've been listening for a while, and you know, it's it strikes me um, as the one thing we've learned from the uh, debt ceiling discussion is that the debt ceiling is not the answer. Whatever the problem is, the debts, the existence of the debt ceiling is not keeping us from being thirty trillion dollars in debt. And the reason is because it's the, the real analogy. It's not some morning light. It's the credit card bill. You've already you've already spent that money. You, your family, your spouse, your kids. They already rang up that, that account. And the only responsible thing to do is to pay the bill. And by the time you get to the bill, it's too late to talk about the spending. Let's face facts that the, the, the debt ceiling has become a political cudgel rather than some sort of useful um, policy tool. So those of us who are, are uh, worried about debt and deficit shouldn't just talk about whether this is good or bad. It's clearly not doing the job. Let's talk about something new. And um, I think a lot of my, my good colleagues on the Democratic side support repealing the debt, the debt ceiling uh, limit altogether. And I think there's good reason for that because it is an artificial tool. Uh, it carries too much risk to be used for political games. But um, I don't think one of my Republican uh, colleagues just thinks we can get rid of it. So last year, I just wanna let you know, I teamed up with Congressman Jody Arrington and the Bipartisan Policy Center to craft and introduce the Responsible Budgeting Act. So this bill would, would eliminate the danger of debt limit brinksmanship and offers Congress two ways to actually deal with the national debt. First, we would pass a budget resolution that satisfies specific debt reduction measures while simultaneously passing a joint resolution that the president can sign to, to suspend the debt limit in the next, until the next fiscal year. And then if Congress fails to pass that concurrent budget resolution, the second option allows the president to suspend the debt ceiling him or herself which Congress could vote to override. And with the suspension, the president's obligated to send a debt reduction proposal to the Hill. Uh, Congress would have to consider that proposal or come up with something of its own. It's a little bit complex, but it's a heck of a lot better than pointing fingers at each other and, and dodging the bullet every, um, every year or two. So um, Dr. Blessing, you noted that while the debt ceiling debate may bring attention to fiscal issues, it carries too much risk to be considered a useful a tool do you think a reform like the one I described could move the ball forward in having a more productive conversation about controlling federal debt? Very important question. Um, I mean, my testimony has emphasized both the benefits and limitations of procedural reform like this. Um, having the president be allowed to um, you know, uh, suspend the debt ceiling with Congress being able to then disapprove of it and you've paired it with additional things, uh, but that's sort of a mechanism uh, would absolutely be safer than the status quo. The safest possible thing, of course, is to to remove it from the field of right. political contestation right. altogether. Right. Dr. Shaner, do you, you agree that breaching the debt limit would affect the standing and competitiveness of the United States and the global economy, right? Definitely. Um, I don't know if you think something like our proposal, which would eliminate the hostage taking um, and reduce the risk of default. I mean, I, I think probably there's a there's an appetite for getting rid of all together, but failing that, is that the kind of thing we should be looking for? Yeah, definitely. So I agree with Dr. Blessing. Getting rid of it would be great, but if what you need to do is get rid of the uncertainty, right? You need to basically take it off the table as a possibility. And so whatever procedural reforms could get you there that could actually pass, you know, would be a step in the right direction. Well, I, I just say, I think that um, uh, both parties uh, have, have, have been, um, uh, responsible for adding to the debt, I think for good reasons and, and other reasons. Um, it would be great if this committee, the members of this committee could come together. If you're really concerned about re reducing the deficit, uh, for forcing us to make those tough decisions uh, through a bill like the one we proposed. Um, Mr. Chairman, I support uh, eliminating the debt ceiling in the event that that doesn't happen. I think we need to reform it, but I don't wanna pretend that this, this is somehow the answer to any problem. 
to any question that we face. Uh, this is not the tough. This is not the tough decision making we say we want to be called on to make. Um, and uh, I, I thank you for having this hearing, and I yield back. A gentleman yields back, and I now recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Obernolte, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thanks to everyone for participating in this critically important hearing. Uh, I want to touch on something that Congressman Smucker brought up, which is that the fact that we're having this discussion about the debt limit, uh, you know, really is, is means we're not talking about the larger picture here, which is uh, the federal deficit and our rising national debt. Uh, the one thing that the debt limit does force us to do is periodically have a discussion about the debt and how we're going to pay back the money that we're borrowing. So we, we've had a discussion here in this hearing about the recent letter from the Congressional Budget Office and a, a debate about whether or not real wagers are keeping up with inflation. But I wish that we were talking more about another document from the CBO uh, a, a few months ago, which was their budget forecast. Uh, I think uh, Congressman Feenstra touched on this a little bit. Uh, th that forecast is eye-opening. I mean, it paints, uh, even under the most rosy scenario, which is that uh, we don't have another major recession. We don't have another major war. Congress doesn't enact any new spending measures uh, that, that promote deficit spending. Uh, and the uh, 2017 tax cuts expire on, on time. You know, if all four of those things happen, then by the end of the forecast period, which is 2051, our national debt will only be 200% of our gross domestic product. Just paying interest on that national debt will consume 9% almost of our entire economy, which is over half of federal tax revenue. And you know the, the really distressing thing about that is that's assuming that interest rates are within the range that the CBO projects now. If we have to raise interest rates to control inflation, uh, the CBO says that easily just paying interest on the debt could be 25% of GDP and over 100% of all of our federal tax revenue. So uh, that's what you know we need to, to focus on. And I think any discussion of eliminating the debt ceiling has to be paired with a discussion uh, about what our solution is to getting that, that national debt and our federal spending under control. So I really wish if we were talking about eliminating the debt ceiling, we would pair that with a measure, uh, for example, maybe a congressional budget, a, 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 budget a, a constitutional amendment requiring a balanced budget. I've introduced legislation that does that. I know other members of the committee have induced legislation that requires that. Uh, this is not a new idea. Almost all of the states require a balanced budget. My home state of California, I mean, obviously a very blue state, but uh, we have one of the strongest balanced budget requirements. And before my two years here on house budget, I spent five years as what we would call ranking member of the budget committee in the California legislature. And, you know, we made it work. Uh, and sometimes the minority party even, even voted for it. So this, this could be a template for uh, what the federal government does. And then uh, lastly, before I get to a question or two here, uh, I just want to talk about the specific proposal that's been raised here uh, in the hearing today, which is to transfer responsibility for raising the, the debt ceiling from the legislative branch to the executive branch and giving the Department of the Treasury that authority. And uh, this is something I've spent some time thinking about, and I would str strongly say that that's a bad idea. Uh, a few years ago, I wrote a doctoral dissertation on managing budgetary conflict between the legislative and executive branches. And as part of that research, we looked at the mechanisms that shift the balance of power between the executive and legislative branches at the federal level. And here's the problem with giving the Department of the Treasury that authority. Uh, the, their time horizon is much shorter because administrations come and go every four years or at most every eight years. Doing something like controlling federal spending is really politically difficult. And it's not something that you can get done on that short a time horizon. Uh, and politically, it's gonna be much more difficult for the executive branch to do that. So I, I would urge caution there. Uh, so uh, let me ask uh, Mr. Mulvaney, I, I think you've got some fascinating experience having served in both the legislative and the executive branches. Uh, do you think that, that Congress should essentially abdicate its responsibility for this and give it to the executive branch? And if not, what do you think the long-term solution is to controlling federal spending? Do you think it's uh, something like a balanced budget requirement? The, the longer answer is it, it just will. It's political will. The voters have to send people to office who care about balancing the budget and spending less. They're not doing that yet. So yeah, it, it will change, take a cultural change in Washington. Washington is set up right now to spend more money every single year but because of the way that the budget process works, because of the way the CBO project works. Listen, that's a longer discussion for another day. Uh, as to uh, Mr. Boyle's suggestion about giving the Treasury, I'm sitting here 
Oh, I'm torn because I think the chances of me going back in the legislative branch are probably pretty low. Chances of me going back in the in the executive branch are probably pretty good. So yeah, give us give us more authority, please. Give us more power. No, don't do that. I mean, isn't that part of the problem we have right now? Is that we you guys delegate so much authority to the executive branch, and then you don't let the executive branch actually do it. They can't fire people. They can't hire people. They can actually run the government. Um, then you try to micromanage them on how you spend money by putting line items in appropriations bills, uh, and the whole thing just starts to break down. No, don't give more authority to the executive branch. By the way, you've got the same authority authority right now, I think, on regs. You delegate all the regs down to the administrative, to the executive branch, and you can oversee them, but you never do. Um, so you can overrule them, but you never do. So no, please don't give more authority to the executive branch. Uh, that is not a that is not a, a resolution to hardly anything. Well, thanks. And I see my time's expired, but uh, let me just highlight something that you said, which is that uh, the rules aren't broken here. Congress is broken. And in the future, as we have these discussions, Mr. Chairman, I hope that we can pivot away from pointing fingers at each other about which administration racked up the debt and whose fault it is, and instead focus on what the long-term solutions are, because uh, you know that's really why I think the elephant in the room. I yield back. The uh, gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize the gentlewoman from Washington, Ms. Jayapal, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing. Uh, I think we've heard multiple times how the national debt ceiling is a source of much dysfunction in Congress without serving a substantive purpose. And it's important to note that limits on the treasury were not originally instituted to constrain deficit spending at all, but rather evolved from a bill aimed at granting the treasury more authority to issue bonds to pay for World War I, to loosen restrictions on borrowing by imposing a one-time arbitrary limit on bond issuance instead of authorizing war spending on an as-needed basis. So I thought it would be good to take a little trip down the historical lane just to show how far we've strayed and how today the debt ceiling simply does more harm than good. So Dr. Blessing, when prior to World War I, Congress authorized the Treasury to issue debt in varying types of bonds for specific purposes and amounts, how did that uh, change the, how did Congress change the Treasury's authority during the war and what was the rationale, briefly? Uh Congress, I, I thank you for the historical corrective. I think it's uh, really important for, for people to understand this. Um, uh, Congress want, saw that uh, under wartime conditions that Treasury was going to need more flexibility and be able to uh, you know, better address the war effort. And in order to you know, Dr. Blessing, you are coming in and out. This was not an effort at constraining um, either overall debt. Constraining. Oh gosh, how's this? <laughs> well, you're you're on, back uh, again. Dr. Blessing, you're on better, I'm sorry. It's cutting out. Um, and you're frozen now on screen. Um, uh, see if she, okay. are you back? No, you're still frozen. Okay. I, I could go to some other I can see you. Okay. Turn off your camera, maybe. Oh, OK. Well, Want to try that, Dr. Blessing? Turn you off your camera for a yeah. second and see if you can just, if we can hear you. Of course. How's that? That's much better. And Mr. Chairman, you. if you wouldn't mind restoring some of my time, that I would No, I, I will. Thank you. Go ahead, Dr. Blessing. Uh, the, the congresswoman is absolutely Right. Um, the uh, uh, with the change in the 1917 uh, law with the Second Liberty Bond Act, the idea was not rain debt uh, or yearly deficit was to uh, you know enable the Treasury Department to have greater flexibility and to also modernize federal finance. Shoot, Dr. Blessing, unfortunately, we are just not able to hear you. So I think I'm going to go to a, a different. Yeah, uh, no, you, you sound so not working. Feels not working. <laughs> no, we can't hear you either. Uh, okay. All right, we're going to try this again, and I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to ask questions of a different uh, of a different witness. Sorry about that, Dr. Blessing. I was looking forward to that. 
But um, let, let me go to Dr. Shainer. Um, even after Congress raises the ceiling after default, the damage will be done. And by some estimates, 6 million jobs would evaporate and delays to crucial social safety payments would devastate families already living hand to mouth. How long would it take for the economy to recover after breaching the debt limit? Yeah, I think we don't know the answer to that question. It really does depend on what happens to financial market perceptions, whether people understand that, yes, we breached the limit, but it's gonna be very short and we can take it in stride or whether or not it really says, oh my God, there's so much dysfunction here. And that would just undermine confidence and that could take a very long time um, to get back. And so we've never done that before. And so I think the uncertainty is, is huge. Um, and so the way I think about it is not that it would necessarily be a, you know, many, many quarters of recession, but it has the possibility. And why risk that, right? And it has the possibility of just deeply undermining faith in the U.S. economy that might last many, many years. Well, that, that's a really important point as well, because it's been a major priority of Congress to help maintain America's competitiveness in a globalized economy. And so, you know, if, if we were to breach the debt limit, can you give us a sense of what that would do to the standing of the United States in the global economy? I mean, I think that the U.S. federal government has this reputation as, the, you know, our treasuries are the safest and they're, they're the most liquid and we have a huge advantage and our borrowing costs are lower because of that. And so that puts that at risk, even if it put it, you know, we just lost some of the advantage, it would cost a lot given the size of our debt. And so why risk it? And then I think there's a broader question that I can't really answer, but just it's, it's beyond just interest rates. It's this view of the U.S. as a global leader. And when your politics get so dysfunctional that you don't pay your bills and that you cause a recession because you couldn't get the political act together, that just has really unpredictable, but obviously not good uh, uh, re repercussions for the U.S. as a global leader. And what about the potential global spillovers from a breach in the debt limit? Right. I mean, so we have a global capital market. People rely on U.S. Treasuries everywhere as the safest asset. We've seen other episodes where there have been minor, you know, dysfunctions in the Treasury market kind of affecting the whole world. And if this was something major, yeah, it could throw, you know, mar global markets in turmoil, you know, and then much would depend on what the Federal Reserve did. And did they come in and fix it? Could they do that? It's just this huge unknown um, about what would happen, but it does have serious repercussions and just really hard to assess exactly what those would be. Well, given all of that, um, I was going to go down history lane with Dr. Blessing. I, yeah. I know you said you're not a historian, so I'm yeah. not making you answer those questions. But here's my last question that I yeah. was going to ask her that I think you could answer, yeah. which is, given the fact that the debt ceiling has evolved into a practice so far from its original intent and carries the enormous risk that you have laid out, why has this policy persisted for so long? And what are the repercussions if we continue to allow it to persist? I mean, it's not just that it's persisted, but I think that it's gotten more pernicious over time, right? We've come closer to breaching it in the past 10 years. As I said, I wasn't sure what was gonna happen this time. It seems like we're getting closer and closer to the point where we actually might step over that breach. So I think it's a very dangerous thing to have and I don't think it does anything good in terms of thinking about our long-term problems in a way that makes sense. Um, and so I think it, it should go. I think it's a, a risky and not a helpful uh, part of our process. Thank you, Dr. Shainer, and thank you, Chairman Yarmouth. I, I appreciate the, <laughs> the latitude there given our tech Absolutely. Problem. No, no problem at all. Uh, gentleman, the woman's time has expired and now recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Donalds for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This has been a very interesting hearing to say the least. I mean, look, the reality is before I got to Congress, I never liked hearing y'all talk about the debt ceiling. And now that I'm in Congress, I don't really like hearing y'all talk about the debt ceiling because the truth is, is that this is not about quote unquote paying our bills. This is about us not changing our spending habits and wanting more money from capital markets so we don't have to change. This whole idea about brinksmanship to me is what the, the legislative process is supposed to be about. If you cannot find a way to work on both sides of the aisle to actually figure out a path forward for raising the, 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 the nation's national credit card, then that means that you can't even get together to figure out how to reform your spending. If you can't reform your spending, you're gonna run amuck. So that's why capital markets and the credit rating agencies look at us 
from a funny perspective of are they ever going to get their act together? Because we never do the hard things in DC. That's what I've seen before I got here. And that's frankly what I'm seeing now. Um, we, there is no way we should be abolishing the debt ceiling vote or getting rid of the debt ceiling vote. That makes no sense at all. Because if we're going to be the body, especially in the House, that authorizes all spending, then we should also be the body that authorizes the debt position of the United States. And you can't just put it in the executive branch, branch's hands, essentially, especially when we do that with so many other things in Congress. Um, I really do want to thank the witnesses because I've been listening intently. And as far as I'm concerned, I think all the questions have really been asked, but I think it was more important for me to just, you know, for whatever it's worth, make, make the clear statement that the members of Congress, both sides of the aisle, we actually need to let this committee do its full job, which is actually creating a budget, actually figuring out what our spending parameters can be, figuring out what that's going to be looking like in the future. And we should not be turning over borrowing of debt to the executive branch without a say from Congress. And I understand one of the proposals that Congress would have to vote to not let, let the, the executive branch do something. That doesn't make any sense because you can hardly get Congress to agree on a lot of things. We have to do the hard work. It starts with us in the people's body. We should not be moving those spending decisions and those borrowing decisions off to the executive branch. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, now recognize the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Brooklyn five minutes. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to, one of my colleagues a little bit earlier talked about uh, making Congress more responsible. And I'm just going to point out, I, I've, been, I've been here for, for seven years. I can imagine saying make co making Congress less irresponsible, but to, to say we're building off the responsibility of Congress is not something I have noticed so far. Now we still have, oh, Mick Mulaney is still there. Hey, Mick, glad to see you again. Um, I, I got a question for you. Um, it seems to me that one of the results of excessive spending is inflation. And I'm not even sure all members of the Federal Reserve get that right now, but is that true? And do you believe the current, uh, I, I guess I call it cruel tax because Congress never votes on it. It's really a regressive tax. It hurts the little guy the most. But uh, do you believe the current um, penalty on the average American housing costs, uh, fuel costs, food costs is caused by excessive federal spending? Yeah, um, you know, Glenn, you and I are old enough, as are a couple of people on this committee, not nearly as many as I'd like, but because uh, I don't want to feel like I'm the elder statesman here. Remember what inflation is. Inflation is too much money chasing too few goods. And right now, because a lot of the policies you've got in Washington, D.C., y'all are pumping money into the system. Now, granted, a lot of that was necessary because of COVID. I'm not, I'm not trying to criticize everything that happens, but you have had the, the, the end result of what you've done is to dump a whole bunch of money in the system. At the same time, because of COVID, but also because of some of the policies re-regulating the economy, for example, you've, it's been harder and harder to get goods to market. So more money chasing fewer goods equals inflation. And it is the worst kind of tax. It absolutely is. Uh, you, yeah, you don't vote on it, um, but it does impact the folks, the folks that my Democrat friends say they care the most about, the folks at the bottom end of the economic scale. It affects them more than anybody else and negatively. I own assets, okay? Many people on this, on this call own assets. Our assets are going up in value because of inflation. If you're at the bottom end of the scale, you don't own anything. You're, you're living paycheck to paycheck and, and you're spending 100%, if not more, of that paycheck on money, on things you need every single week and your quality of life is going down. So no, inflation, I think, is one of those. It's the scourge. Listen, it was bad. It was really bad in the late 1970s, early 1980s. People remember it nowadays to know how, how debilitating inflation can be. And yes, Washington is a driving factor behind that. Not the only one. COVID certainly plays a role, but Washington can and should be doing more to alleviate inflation instead of making it worse, which is what I think y'all are doing. I'm going to give you a question. and Maybe this is an unfair question because you didn't know it was coming. Uh, but obviously, the day of reckoning is coming, right? Uh, and when the day of reckoning happens, there's going to have to be some reduction in spending. I personally don't think we should ever cut Social Security. People have paid into that, and that's the one thing we shouldn't cut, which means many other programs, which are arguably or maybe not even arguably uh, under our Constitution, shouldn't be the role of the federal government, are going to have to be looked at very carefully. Um, do you know uh, if we try to balance the budget? say next year, the year after, 
and we leave Social Security and Medicare off the table, um, percentage wise, how much of everything else would we do? You, unfair question. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I used to know that off the top of my head. Uh, that used to be my job, but I, I haven't looked at that in a while. My guess is, I don't know, it's probably 20%. If you take Social Security and Medicare, keep in mind, Social Security, uh, Medicare and Medicaid are 75% of government expenditures. The budget, you guys know this better than anybody, y'all only budget roughly 25% of what, of what the government spends. So if you take 75% of the spending off of the table and you try and balance it based upon the rest of it, um, it's going to be very, very difficult. I used to you know, tell people we could, you know, we could cut the defense budget to to zero and you still wouldn't balance the budget. In fact, last year you could have cut all discretionary spending to zero and you wouldn't have balanced the budget because you're more than a trillion. What's the budget this year? 1.4, 1.5 trillion dollars? Huge. Listen, the better question is, if you needed to, could you balance the budget next year? If you really needed to, or the, the, the most severe circumstances, could Congress get together and balance the budget next year if they, if they needed to? I'm not sure, I'm not sure you could. Okay, I'm, I'm kind of jealous of Chairman Yarmouth and maybe jealous of you, uh, Director Mulvaney. I can't remember when you got here. Uh, you were here when the sequester was put in place. I think maybe the best piece of public policy we've seen in the last 20 years. Do you believe the sequester would have happened without the requirement for a debt deal? Guaranteed 100% the budget control, which included the sequester, never would have happened but for a debt ceiling discussion. Uh, when I look at the last I, seven years, go ahead. Does anybody on this committee, anybody in Congress who would, who would disagree with that statement? Absolutely tremendous. I think maybe people on the committee are we going to distribute next time we meet uh, the increase every year in discretionary spending for the last uh, 20 years and see the wonderful seven year period of sequester. Now, I know eventually the, when the Republicans were in charge, uh, some people felt the need to break it, but um, I think it's something that uh, we could perhaps revisit in the future since it's something that both sides agreed upon once. Um, uh, I think, can I ask, uh, did his clock malfunction? Doesn't seem like he's been there for five minutes. The show's expired, Mr. Grothman, but I'm going to give you a, That's a just time. because Grothman is so engaging. It, it, he slows yeah. down time when he talks. <laughs> if you have one more question, Glenn, go ahead and ask it. Okay. Th that's okay. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll leave it at that, but I, I appreciate you having the hearing. As you know, I'm, I'm hopeful for many more hearings. I've always loved the Budget Committee. So thank you for, for, for having us, the hearing, Chairman Yarmouth, and I hope it's the thank first of several. All right, thanks very much. Uh, gentleman's time has expired, and now we welcome to the committee once again for his first uh, appearance uh, before us, Mr. Kerry of Ohio. You have five minutes. Well, I won't take that, Mr. Chairman, but I do thank you for the opportunity to speak. I do thank the witnesses uh, here, the, although virtually. I guess, uh, you know, most of the questions that uh, have been addressed kind of really were kind of in line with what I was going to ask. I guess, Director. What I would like to ask you is I remember working as a young staffer in the 1990s, uh, we had wanted to push a balanced budget amendment. And had we accomplished that in 1990, you know, 1995, 1996, where would we be today in terms of the issue that we're discussing that's, that's before us this afternoon? And I'll wait for your answer. Yeah, I think the debt ceiling was probably what? Uh, a couple trillion dollars back in the mid 90s? So you granted, you probably have to you probably have to uh, uh, to go into debt a little bit to to handle uh, to handle COVID. Probably some other things that the financial crisis of two thousand eight probably incurs some debt there. So maybe it's up, you know, a trillion or two. Uh, listen, I was not a big fan of the war in Iraq, which contributed to the uh, to the deficit as well. So yeah, um, so ballpark maybe your six or eight trillion dollars in debt right now if you if if that passes and if we can live up to it. Listen, I had a chance to vote on it in two thousand and twelve, I think. And it didn't pass in large part because some Republicans didn't vote for it. So um, it's, a, it's a real shame. Uh, someone mentioned earlier that California has a balanced budget amendment. By the way, and I, I don't want to filibuster your question, but I, I would encourage this because this is one of the you know, rare possibilities for bipartisanship. State government works. 
State government works better than the federal government does. One of the reasons the state government works, in addition to the fact that the minority has rules that protect it, is that they have to balance the budget and they have to sit down and work together with folks in the other party. Y'all don't have to do that because you own the printing press. If you had a balanced budget amendment, it might actually make your jobs more enjoyable, not less, because you'd actually be forced to do things on a bipartisan basis. I'll get off my soapbox. Oh, Director, I appreciate the, the candidness and I appreciate you uh, uh, being the first person I've ever asked a question to. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Smith, I appreciate the time and I do yield back. Uh, gentlemen, it yields back the balance of his time. Once again, we welcome him to the committee. I now yield myself uh, 10 minutes and I probably won't take all 10, but I, I do want to comment on a few things. First of all, let me say that uh, I think this, this hearing has been done with a great deal of thought and civility and, uh, and, and I think in, with a very positive attitude about uh, dealing with this question of the debt ceiling. So I know one person said we blamed, uh, going back and forth with blame, we really didn't. There were a couple of, couple of times, but not, 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 not like normal for sure. So uh, I appreciate all the members' contribution and the witnesses' uh, answers as well. You know, one of the things that, that occurs to me, and I know people have said uh, so many times during this hearing that it's not the rules that are broken, it's, it's the Congress that's broken. And back in 2017, uh, I was part of a joint select committee, uh, members, House and Senate, Bipartisan, uh, former chairman uh, and ranking member Womack of Arkansas was, was one of the co-chairs of that group. And we met periodically for the entire year in 2017. It, it was a joint select committee on budget and, uh, and appropriations reform. And the whole idea was trying to figure out if there were things we could do better, that were, there were rules that we could change that would make the budget process more effective and so forth. And after months and months and months, I think we had seven different hearings. We had people from across the philosophical spectrum, economists and, and others. The, the conclusion that we all reached was it wasn't the rules. <laughs> it was the people and the, and the, the, the uh, willingness of the, the members of the House and Senate to responsibly deal with their uh, uh, responsibilities. And it wasn't because, you know, we talked about uh, tr uh, triggers on spending. We talked about balanced budget amendments. We talked about no pay, no budget, no pay, all of those things. And again, the conclusion on a bipartisan basis was none of those things would really change unless the members change and unless the willingness of the members to be, again, to be responsible and responsive to the, the environment <laughs> change. So um, I, I say that having called this hearing about the debt ceiling and proposals to change a significant rule. And the, the one thing that I, I know, I think uh, Mr. Mulvaney talked about, I love the first names, uh, but I'm gonna remain somewhat formal, uh, talked about in terms of giving up power of the purse. Uh, I think you could argue that having the debt ceiling gives up, has already taken the power of the purse away from us because it says we're going to execute our responsibilities, we're going to appropriate funds, and then we don't allow those, if we have the debt ceiling, we don't allow those decisions to be implemented uh, freely. And so, again, uh, I think this discussion has been, been very, very important and, and useful. And, I'm, I'm not sure we'll have another hearing on it, but uh, I think it has prompted discussions. And, and then finally, the notion of the fact that we don't discuss the deficit and the debt uh, without talking about the debt ceiling, I think that's not true. I think we talk about the debt and the deficit all the time. Now, do we do anything about it? Not really, uh, but we, we talk about it all the time. And there's a great deal of consciousness of it, and, which says to me the, the one justification for keeping the debt ceiling, which I've heard today, is that it's an effective extortion measure to get policies enacted that otherwise wouldn't be very popular or couldn't generate enough support uh, to be passed, like sequestration. Uh, that to me 
does not does not justify keeping it. It actually is a good reason, as far as I'm concerned, to get rid of it. If all it is is a wedge uh, to, either, to either get pol difficult policies passed or uh, to uh, again to force us to uh, to force one side or the other to make concessions. So anyway, what I would like to do in the, the remaining five minutes is just to give because I know a lot of the uh, Dr. Blessing, her sound went out. I don't know if you're back online, but just to give you all a, a minute or two, uh, I can give each of you a minute and 15 seconds to, if you have comments about things that have been said today that you've been waiting to respond to one way or another. If there haven't, if there aren't, that's fine. So Dr. Blessing, you want to take a shot? Is there anything you'd like to say in summary, things you've heard today that you'd like to make a comment on? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for a wonderful hearing, uh, and thank you for everyone uh, at the committee. Um, I've some of the, the later responses were vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, uh, giving up uh, power to the executive branch. Um, and here's the thing: while I think we should be concerned about uh, Congress as an institution and making it more powerful and congressional capacity, I don't believe that doing away with the debt ceiling or any of the reforms that have been mentioned would it uh, mean giving up power to the executive branch? Um, because they're only lifting the debt ceiling. They're not making policy. Congress has already made all of the spending policy, all of the taxing policy that would affect the debt ceiling and overall levels of debt. So I don't see this as an abrogation of Congress's you know, fiscal responsibility or any giving, giving of any policy relevant power to the executive branch. Uh, so I just wanted to address that in particular. Um, in addition to all of my comments. Great, thank you, Dr. Blessing. And by the way, if you would like to uh, uh, provide in writing your response on the historical uh, context of the debt ceiling that you, we couldn't get you in on the audio, uh, we'd love to have your, your comments in writing for the record. Happy to. Great, thanks. Uh, Dr. Shaner. I don't have much to add. I will say I was. I, I'm glad you said that. You always talk about the debt because I'm like we always. I always talk about the debt and the deficits. Don't know. Is it really possible that you guys never do? I thought that was unlikely. Um, so I'm glad to hear that you do. Uh, it is a big issue. I the, the only one thing I want to say is when we talk about like like anything that you do that lowers the debt is a good thing. Like that's not necessarily the case. The reason this is such a hard hard problem is that you really have to balance the benefits of what you're what the money that you're spending the cost of any taxes what's the best way forward what's the timing low interest rates have a lot to do with how much you room that you may have and so i just think this i this notion that well the debt ceiling forces us to make action and therefore every action is definitely good i think is something that's not exactly right which is why this conversation needs to be done not about the debt ceiling where you're under you know under the gun but really in a way where you can really address the nuances of policy. Thank you, uh, Ms. Russell. Any Hi, final yeah. comments? Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today and to listen to this uh, fantastic conversation. Just want to reiterate the importance of you know, stability from the small business perspective and looking at our ecosystem and looking how small business really impacts the American economy. It's really important. I think sometimes small businesses get lost in the mix because we're always talking big economics and big business. But when you look at the impact of small businesses across the country, we are really making the most difference in the most areas and especially in our communities. And so I thank you for this opportunity for to represent small businesses and to keep them and keep us uh, top of mind. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Mulvaney, would you like the final word? John, I will, because I'll say something that hopefully is interesting, which is I yep. think that the best thing that I'm going to take away from this is that Sheila and I may have hit on something. Uh, and I'm willing to 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 accept your 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 premise that you guys talk about debt and deficits more than maybe I perceive now that I'm no longer inside the building. <laughs> but Sheila, Sheila talked about you know sitting down at the table. Listen, if y'all were to pass one or two or three really good fiscal reform bills without having the debt ceiling held to your head, you might convince folks like me that we don't need it anymore. Uh, again, I think we're all concerned about the same thing, which is how do we make sure the debt doesn't ruin us. Um, uh, I think we're just disagreeing on the on the best way to accomplish that. But if you all sit down and, and hack out something that say that, that reduces the deficit without having it be under the the, the sort of Damocles that the the, the, uh, the debt ceiling makes, then maybe you could convince me we can get rid of it after that. So 
Uh, anyway, thanks for the chance for, to do this. It's good to see everybody. And I, uh, it's one of the rare, rare days I miss being uh, in my old job. <laughs> well, I'll join you uh, in a few months and uh, we can miss it together uh, and, and hopefully get out on the, the golf course. Uh, once again, thanks to all the witnesses. Uh, it's been a very enlightening hearing. I appreciate your time and responses. And unless there is any further business before the committee, uh, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you all so much. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.